This is TWIS, This Week in Science, episode number 472, recorded on Thursday, July 10th, 2014. Science is never over. Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Kiki, and today this episode of This Week in Science will fill your head with a Neanderthal ear bone, reanimated spiders, and sk stinky skin? Yeah. But first... Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. The world you are living in is the world of today. It is not the world you were born into, and with some luck, it is not the world in which you will die. In this day and age of here and now, we have inherited a past filled with innovation and ignorance. As a people, we have mastered nature, technology, and information as tools to increase our health, wealth, and knowledge. On the shoulders of giants, we pioneered from the moon to Mars and beyond the solar system. We broke the genetic code, can carry the Library of Alexandria on a thumb drive, and in our pockets is a communication device more powerful than anything ever placed in the hands of an individual. At the same time, we have polluted our atmosphere to the point of altering the climate to a disastrous future consequence. Our role in the present, the actions we take today, will reverberate through the future timelines of our species. No pressure. It thankfully won't take all of us to make a difference, but it will take you. Because you more so than most humans, are informed. You know the issue, the stakes, and the solution. And besides, you've seen who your neighbors are, and it isn't them the future is going to rely on. And you know this is right, because right now you are listening to This Week in Science, coming up next. I've got the kind of mind I can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to feel to you, Kirsten. Good science to you too, Justin. Here we are once again on the brink of our show. It's just the, the beginning. Very, the very beginning. A show is about to blossom right here, right now in front of us. Exciting! It's so exciting. And before we get started, I would like to share some news with everybody. Our co-host Blair has been traveling in Israel for the last week and a half-ish. And people have been concerned as to her well-being, considering the political uh, situation over there and the bombing situation going on right now. So she wants everyone to know that she is just fine and she'll be back hopefully next week, I believe, for her animal corner once again. Everything is just fine. And now on with the show. This week I brought a whole bunch of stuff about Neanderthals and ancient humans. Um, what else did I bring? Pesticides and bees. It's, it's, it's all the pesticides and bees. Oh, and... Frame, shi frame shifting genes. Hmm. Yeah. What'd you bring, Justin? I've got a bird fossil, bird like fossil, that may be about to challenge a lot of beliefs about the evolution of the bird. Ooh. Really? Yeah. I know, I know, right? I thought we got this one pretty well locked down, and then come along comes a fossil that's like, yeah, explain me. Explain me. And that's what's happening now. Um, cool. We also have Let's talk about that. Yeah, being able to smell with your skin, and that would be skin not in your nose. I right? can't wait to talk about this right? one. That's going to be kind of interesting. Uh, yeah. No mutations is good mutations, uh, and uh, climate change, which comes up occasionally on this. It does. We do discuss this topic occasionally. All right. Well, since I can't ask Blair what she's going to talk about, um, we'll just get into the news. 
Oh, exoplanets, the planet that was potentially a habitable exoplanet that wasn't. What? We no. lost a planet? We lost an exoplanet, maybe even two, maybe even more. Uh -oh. So the system of finding exoplanets is... It's a difficult system. These are very faint signals, and the data must be sifted through very accurately. And then it must be looked at again by other people to make sure that everyone agrees that the signal you have is actually that of a planet orbiting another star. So uh, around 2007, a system was announced called Gliese 581, Gliese 581, and this star had several planets, has, still does have several planets around it, but there were a couple known as 581D and 581G, the letters D and G indicating how far they are from the star. So the closest one would be A, furthest one would be, you know, whatever, however many planets there are away. Um, Anyway, there we've been in, in improving our ability to eliminate uh, signals from uh, from stellar activity to make them to get clearer signals, so that we know that the signal we're, you're looking at, the scientists are looking at, is not an artifact of some kind. Now, in 2010. Um, Stephen Voigt was the leader of the team from the University of Santa Cruz. He announced Gliese 581G and said that he was almost, and I, I'm not exactly quoting him, but he was pretty darn sure that this planet was going to have life on it. Like he was so sure of this planet, number one, and number two, he was positive this planet would be habited, inhabited. Not just be habitable, but be inhabited. And mm -hmm. now we come to the most recent updating of this story. And researchers have looked at the data again. And they say, nope, there's only three planets around this star. This 581D and 581G that were supposedly around the star, they're not there. They were from Doppler shifts. And uh, Penn State researchers who were involved in this reanalysis of these small planets say that these Doppler shifts can result from subtle changes in the star's velocity caused by the gravitational tugs of orbiting planets. So basically, the planets are orbiting around it, and the gravitational pull that they actually elicit upon the star can make the star move maybe a little bit faster for a second or make change the way that the energy, the radio signals that we're looking at um, approach our planet. And so um, they say the Doppler shifts of a star's absorption lines can also result from magnetic events like sunspots originating within the star itself, giving false clues of a planet that does not actually exist. Well, okay, so it's a couple down, but we still have several hundred. <laughs> that are still yeah. working, right? Yeah, we okay. still have many, many possible exo. There are many, many exoplanets that have been confirmed, number one. There are many potentially habitable exoplanets that have also been confirmed. It's just that these, they just, they bared, bared, bared having a little bit closer look. And that's the whole process of science, and that's the process of looking at these exoplanets as well, is that um, teams report on their findings that they think that there's an exoplanet in a certain location, and then other teams go back to the data, and they look again, and they have corroborating, or in this case, not corroborating results. And so that's how you eventually decide whether or not there's a planet there. And it is a wobbly method that they're using uh, to, to discover these. I mean, they're looking in a in literally a little wobble in the signature that's coming from one of these stars that indicates a planet's passing uh, between us and it. So it's a, it's a very tough uh, find to begin with. It's not like we've got telescopes that are reaching out there and getting us back information or anything like that. It's they're really having to set through some uh, some some fuzzy 
fuzzy data to find them in the first place. So yeah. we had a couple, uh, now they're gone, we'll look elsewhere. Good thing I wasn't on that ship that launched there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. I'm like, you know, it's a good thing we found this out now. Or the cryogen ship sailed. Like, right. yeah, you could be the first people yeah. to go to this likely habitable planet around the sun. And here we are two years out. And, ooh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. Well, it's not All like right. they're going to sue. They're not going to come back. Yeah. Um, in other news, Neanderthals. We've heard previously that Neanderthals probably mixed with modern humans. Not probably. It's definite now. It's in the DNA. We can point to the source. We can say how long ago about. It's there. It's known. Not probably. It's there. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll accept that, seeing as I have a bit of that Neander, Neander genome in myself. So I'll accept that. Um, anyway... A skull from about 100,000 years ago that was found 35 years ago in northern China um, has upon some really interesting, um, some very interesting CT scanning of the interior of this skull. They found that there are, um, there is in this one particular particular skull, the inner ear bones that would be found in Neanderthals. So not only have we, uh, have we found genetic evidence of the mixing of populations, this is a very interesting find by uh, Eric Trinkhaus, who is a professor from Washington University in St. Louis, who, is, who has studied much of this human uh, ancient human and Neanderthal potential mixing. And he, uh, this paper is published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Um, he says they were completely surprised to find the, these inner ear bones in this mo modern, this, uh, this skull that looks like a modern human one. So he says, we fully expected the scan to reveal a temporal labyrinth that looked much like a modern human one, but what we saw was clearly typical of a Neanderthal. This discovery places into question whether the arrangement of the semicircular canals is truly unique to the Neanderthals. So now it's a question of, mm. we've used this particular arrangement of the inner ear to identify Neanderthal skulls, and now... Is it something that evolved separately or was kind of a variant? Or is it something that in this human skull is indicative of mixing of Neanderthals with humans? So, so it's here, a really interesting yeah. question. And so here's the interesting thing about this is how many of these ancient human skulls uh, do you take to that level of scanning? Well, you know, once you've got a pretty clear idea of what's going to be there, you, you stop looking sort of, you, you're you not looking each time you collect a skull, oh, I wonder what uh, the inner bone structure looks like, you know. You do on a Neanderthal because it's something you've noticed that's a specific thing. You want to learn more about the Neanderthal. The more complete skull you have, the more you want to study it, and they get studied and studied and studied. But ancient human skull, eh, we know what a human skull looks like inside and out. Why look further? They did look further in this study and found this inner ear structure. Sounds to me like this might be one of the sort of missing links, one of the early hybrids of, of man and Neanderthal. And I have a feeling... It you know, could be. It could be, yeah. but... I have a feeling, I, you know, the idea at this point of a co-evolution when there's known crossbreeding to have taken place, that's now the stretch. That, that would be the big stretch compared to being able to assimilate that feature through interbreeding. That's the simple one. That's the proven way that things have happened, uh, you know, that, that, that did take place. So co the co-evolving co just happened to be in the presence in an area where it already evolved, and that's where you happen to evolve it to. That becomes the dubious, I think, uh, hypothesis. Yeah, but the, so the thing here is that this is a fossil, a human fossil from China, Mm -hmm. Can you turn down my spe the speakers on your end a little bit, the monitors? That'd be cool. Um, the 
Ch the, the fossil that was found was from China and so this is not close to the Neanderthal region of Western Europe. So Eastern Asia, very far away from Western Europe. And so as a result, uh, Trinkhaus, who, you know, he's, he's studied this and has suggested that humans and Neanderthals have interbred uh, um, on, and that we should be finding this kind of stuff. But even he and his colleagues are saying that this really just suggests that human populations in the world don't act in simple patterns and that he's arguing that there are broader implications and we shouldn't just fall back on the easy answer of this is indicative of them being connected so as you know sometimes it's like keep it simple stupid you know the kiss principle maybe it is just these populations came together at some point and this is how this inner ear bone came to be in this individual or maybe it's more complicated i'm not sure so uh, but also the the part of that though is uh, you know the fact that it's in eastern asia doesn't doesn't mean that it's any less of a hybrid i mean the population oh, no. it doesn't of course left the middle east post interbreeding to head east i mean that's the melting pot happened a hundred thousand years ago in the Middle East, and the populations there, post after the interbreeding with Neanderthals had taken place, went to Asia. They went to Northern Europe. They went to Siberia. They went to the Americas. They went to South America. They still carry with them the 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 genes from having interbred with Neanderthals when people first got to the Middle East region. And you know, then again. It could be these, this mysterious red uh, deer cave folk. We mm -hmm. don't have enough information about them um, to to say. But uh, ah, so many questions. So many questions. Uh, Trinkhouse goes on to say this study shows that you can't rely on one anatomical feature or one piece of DNA as the basis for sweeping assumptions about migrations of hominid species from one place to another. And um, I think that also can be applied not just to human hominid species, but to any species. You know, we shouldn't just be looking at one anatomical feature or one gene. And so I just want everyone to keep that in mind for our later conversation about the uh, birds and dinosaurs. Birdosaurs. Birdosaurs, Birdosaurus rex. We'll be talking about that in a bit. Um, and then finally, um, another interesting origin of humans. How long ago did we come to be and where did we come from? And anyway, researchers um, have, have uh, taken a look at all of the fossil evidence, the entire body of fossil evidence, they say, relevant to the origin of Homo. That's um, the group within, within which Homo sapiens exists uh, to figure out how we evolved. They looked at all of the defining traits across uh, several skulls and also looked at, compared them against skeletons from Australopithecus. Um, additionally, they compared all of this to a framework of climate within Eastern Africa during the time period of 2.5 million to 1.5 million years ago. Um, one of the researchers says, unstable climate conditions favored the evolution of the roots of human flexibility in our ancestors. The narrative of human evolution that arises from our analyses stresses the importance of adaptability to changing environments rather than adaptation to any one environment in the early success of the genus Homo. Um, so looking at the climate data and fossil data, they reviewed also evidence from stone tools, isotopes in teeth, and cut marks on animal bones in Eastern Africa. And the researchers say that taken together, these data suggest that species of early Homo were more flexible in their dietary choices than other species. Their flexible diet was aided by stone tool assisted foraging that allowed them to exploit more research resources. So flexibility in diet, flexibility and adaptability with tools and different, um, different body traits, morphologies, 
uh, they suggest allowed us to early on be able to kind of take over after Australopithecus. Um, altogether, they say that uh, these all these traits that are the true, these combination of different traits are the true ev evolutionary factors that are important in driving homo to success. Is that is that success compared to what? <laughs> <laughs> Having well, died out, let uh, let other species like Neanderthal take over. Well, oh, like okay, so against other uh, hominid species. Yeah. Okay. Why did Homo sapiens end up being the species? Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. I still think. I mean, I. From everything I've been hearing, it just sounds like all interbreeding, and that's the only thing I will, <laughs> I will accept at this point. Interbreeding, uh, in, so um, from this study, uh, interbreeding was important, but addition and additionally, the variety and the diversity in um, in the way that we looked and the way that we were able to uh, take advantage of our environments and be able to move rapidly when say during climate change an area went from being monsoons to being drought conditions for a long period of time so being able to to take advantage of that capitalize on it and be able to I, succeed. I still don't buy it so so, so I mean I, <laughs> no, I, I believe that we survived this you don't believe we survived I wait that we have thus far survived as a species uh, but you know, and by being clever, we've relied very heavily on being clever over anything else, I suppose. Uh, however, how old would you say our species is? Hundred, couple hundred thousand years, hundreds of thousands of years. You know, you're talking about uh, Australopithecus. Uh, uh, what was it, million plus a couple millions of years? Well, they. So in in terms yeah they evolved of, three to four million years ago I think right. So Pacific. in terms of long term survivability, uh, Homo erectus you know over a million years, Neanderthal even had what four six hundred thousand years in 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 Europe like I, I I don't know if we're really there yet to say this is how we managed to now it is interesting that Homo all of a sudden we're the only like, one standing yeah all of a sudden uh, timeline wise now. Part of me thinks that is just due to interbreeding, and maybe, maybe we have uh, you know more children than than the rest, and we just outbred them. Maybe we we you know something along that lines. I've heard it's possible that the offspring of the hybrids uh, weren't as viable. I mean, not the offspring themselves, but they weren't as fertile. So the human Neanderthal child has less of a chance to have children itself than the human human child because there was more of us being introduced to areas and we were you know, traveling all over the place every time we entered the picture it reduced the amount of Neanderthal genes that would move forward so that's part of it mm -hmm. uh, and the other part is yeah we may have you know been better at being Jerks. Um, we may have been possible. We, we may have been more violent and more efficient at warfare uh, when conflicts did arise. You know, uh, there is there is that thing that us us caution cautious modern humans were throwing spears rather than going up into close contact uh, to to do battle. So that you know, it sort of <clears throat> it sort of makes uh, gives us a distinct advantage in being able to survive conflict. So there's a lot of factors in there, um, but I wouldn't, I don't know that I would put it down to our ability to eat different things, because, you know, we know Neanderthal had a more varied diet than we'd previously given credit to, and you don't survive four or five hundred thousand years in, an, in a region without being able to diversify somewhat, or, you know, or be successful. I, I don't, I don't think you can discount the successes of those. I don't think you can say, ah, oh, it's that cold snap that wiped them out, or the you know the warm snap or the dry season. I don't. I don't buy any of that. I think it has to have, be more direct human influence, modern day human influence into those populations that caused it to all seem to happen around the same times. 
I think it's still I think it's still an open question, but this this paper is something that um you know is it, it gives room for thought. Yeah. And like you said, there's so many questions. And the answer is always Neanderthal. The answer, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, jo Justin, tell me a story. All right. So, well, let's just go with this story. This is the one. Uh, they're re-examining a sparrow-sized fossil from China. And it says here that it's challenging commonly held beliefs that birds evolved from ground-dwelling uh, theropod dinosaurs that eventually over time had gained the ability to fly. This is a uh, bird-like fossil, not a dinosaur, they're saying, uh, but uh, remains a tree-climbing animal that can glide. Hmm. Tree-climbing animal, it's calling it, which is interesting, which almost means that they haven't categorized it. If they've taken it out of dinosaur, I haven't put it into anything else. No, I think they I think they did. So dinosaur is theropod and then um, these are archae I think you I think they were calling this uh, an archaeosaur or something like that. It's a uh, Scansoraptorix. Uh, is a uh, climbing wing. It was found in Inner Mongolia and is part of an ongoing cooperative study with the Chinese Academy of Geological Sciences previously classified as a Colosaurian theropod dinosaur. Research yeah, so and basically, using... basically identified as part of the theropod group from which all of birds were thought to come from. Yeah. yeah. They used a advanced 3D microscope, high resolution photography, low angle lighting to reveal structures, morphology, here we go, structures not clearly visible before. Many ambiguous aspects. The fossil's pelvis, forelimbs, hind limbs, and tail were confirmed. While it was discovered, it had elongated tendons along its tail vertebrae, similar to Veloc the Velociraptor. It's a ground dinosaur again. Connection, right? Yeah. So that said, it, it uh, unequivocally lacks the fundamental structural skeletal features to classify it as a dinosaur. Huh. See, that's... Gosh, that seems interesting. Because, as we know, now, the structure of a skeleton, uh, of a skull of dinosaurs can change dramatically throughout a lifetime. That's how come we ended up with so many uh, 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 different versions of the Triceratops when it turned out the skull could actually migrate the deposits of bone throughout its lifetime to give different morphologies depending on its age. So, right, that's true. Uh, but mm -hmm. interesting that they're pointing to the skull as saying lacking the structures that they would they would expect. But it had a whole bunch of other things that look are bird-like. Yeah. So that's why they were categorizing it as a bird ancestor or a dinosaur ancestor. Yeah. Elongated forelimbs, wing and hind limb uh, feathers, wing membranes in front of its elbow, half moon shaped wrist like bones, bird like perching feet. Yeah. Hmm. So this is going back to so the, the age old debate is tree down did uh, did birds or their ancest ancestral dinosaur cousins start in the trees, climb up the trees, and then jump out of the trees and go tree down to the ground? Or were they running and jumping into the air and going ground up? And uh, so what they are saying here is that this tree-dwelling Scansoriopteryx is tree down. It could climb up a tree and then perch in the branches and then jump down potentially on small prey or... Uh, to get away from um, from things that were chasing it, predators coming after it. Uh, I don't know necessarily that one individual. I mean, it's hard. It, you, we talk about these uh, missing links or um, fossils that are indicative of something. So, like Archaeopteryx was the big fossil find that was like, this is ancient birds. This is going to tell us so much. And that was the only one we had for so long. But now we have 
so many other fossils to look at that we have a much more complete picture. And whereas before we could start an argument based on just Archaeopteryx about how things happened, now we have to look at the entire system and the entire family tree and really figure out how Scansoriopteryx fit into it. Is this one dinosaur fossil going to change the entire picture, whereas we have all this evidence about theropod dinosaurs with feathers and bird-like features, and how is this going to play out? Yeah. And, and looking at the skeleton, it just looks like a tiny dinosaur to me. <laughs> <laughs> I think all little skeletons kind of look like a dinosaur to me. And I think what, another thing about this, we talk about this a lot, and it, it doesn't get discussed as much in dinosaur fossil research because all you have to look at with fossils are what's left. And very, very rarely do you have anything that you can get biological material from, DNA, blood, whatever. There's, you don't, we don't have that. And so we don't have the genes to actually figure out how these relationships between these different species work. And we know from the modern animal world that bird family trees, that mammal family trees are getting rearranged constantly when we uh, take a look at genomes. Because genomes tell a completely different story, more of a real story, than morphology. Because you have things like convergent evolution where some, some animal, for whatever reason, evolved to look like a bird, but is not related at all to this entire group of organisms that also look like birds. And so do you, I, and I think that's where the question comes in. We, don't, we have morphological proof, but um, I don't know that this is enough to really argue that uh, we have to change the story again. Yeah. What do you think? Are you no, convinced? No, I, I agree. I totally agree. This is uh, also looking. This was would have been middle or late Jurassic. Uh, skin, skin Yeah, whiskey renegade is saying. Does this mean that flying squirrels will eventually lead to flying mammals? It's possible, but as it is right now, it's just a kind of convergent evolution thing. Yeah, I and and yeah, and it just it does just to me it does make sense. The I, I like the the tree climber glide down into flight much more than running and jumping. Yeah, you don't like the glider, the you know the idea that you could just run, jump into the air, flap your feathered wings. Yeah, I think I I, I think it would. It's just more logical that you would use it. You know, trying to go from limb to limb. Um, it would be much more, it would be a feature that at least from, you know, a Darwinian sort of point of view, it would be much more of an asset there, so it would be much more likely to get pushed forward and have those features sussed out. Yeah. Then, look what I can do! Woo! <laughs> <laughs> it would be a fun trick, but how much, you know, how really is that really going to, to benefit your your gene pool that you can you can do that little gliding trick for a couple of feet, you know. Well, I mean, if if Scansoriopteryx pans out and more research is done based on this uh, this fossil find or this assessment of this fossil, um, looking at other species a similar way, who knows? We could find out that the tree down will come back into vogue. But I think for now, we can look at it as an interesting sideline and the massive data, the massive observations seem to be pushing for the ground up at the moment. Hmm. At the moment. Um, I'm, I'm going to bet on this bird. <laughs> I'm kind of a sideline, a story from Archaeopter about Archaeopteryx as well. Researchers looking at a recent finding, a recent fossil find of Archaeopteryx, um, have taken kind of a close look at the feathers on the body, above all um, on the legs and the tail. And they 
they published this in Nature. They um, looked at these very, very in a very detailed manner, um, enabling them to determine that on our in Archaeopteryx, this transitional form between reptiles and birds, uh, that and it is a feathered dinosaur. Um, Archaeopteryx, the feathers evolved primarily for insulation and communication. So we're colored probably in a way to communicate certain things like male or female, something like that. And secondarily for the purpose of flight. And so they were co-opted for flight as opposed to actually starting that way. So that is now the question. When feathers first appeared and how often flight evolved that's under debate still. Yeah, I still think it's probably the two species both crossbred with Neanderopteryx. <laughs> that's, the, <laughs> that's how it came to be. Uh, Neanderopteryx. I like it. I like it a lot. Should we take a break? Let's take a break, and then when we come back, we'll have more This Week in Science. Oh, yeah. Audible.com is the leading provider of audiobooks with over 150,000 different titles in their library. We know that you can find one about science if you look for it. Why don't you go give it a try right now? If you head over to audiblepodcast.com slash twists and sign up for their service, they'll give you one free audiobook download. Your choice. They're not going to tell you what to download. You get one choice of yours audiobook download. And then we get a kickback, and you get a free book and Audible. Maybe they have a, a new recruit, someone who loves audiobooks forever. If you've never tried them before, why don't you give them a try? Audiblepodcast.com slash twists right now. Additionally, Twist has merchandise that you might enjoy. So how about a Twist hat or a Twist sweatshirt or a tote bag? Try it. You might like it. If you love Twists, why not wear our logo emblazoned all over your stuff? Share us with the world. Head over to twist.org, our website, and go to our Zazzle store. Within the Zazzle store, you'll find all sorts of options for things that you will just love having close to you. A little bit of Twists in your life. Finally, uh, our show, Twists, is supported by donations from people just like you. Listeners like you, yeah, you right there. Your donations help to pay for our hosting, our band bandwidth, contractors we need to hire to get things done sometimes, fun things that we try to do occasionally, and any amount that you're able to give will help out. So whether you can give two dollars or two hundred or even two thousand dollars, any amount is going to help us do what we do. And it doesn't matter how big or small, it all makes a difference. And we currently have two ways that you can get involved through donating. We have PayPal buttons all over our website. So if you like to use PayPal online, you can go to our website, twist.org, and look for the PayPal donation buttons. They are all over. We try to make it as easy as possible for you to click those buttons. Secondarily, we also have a Patreon account. Patreon is kind of like Kickstarter, but for the arts and for media shows like this week in science so you can be a patron and support us per episode so you can say I'm gonna give you one dollar per episode or five dollars per episode whatever amount that you feel comfortable giving and then in return you get stuff from us isn't that fun it's great so if you like that model you can go to patreon p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash this week in science that's patreon.com slash this week in science 
no matter what you want to do, head over to twist.org, check out the show, and maybe click on a donation button or head over to Patreon. Whatever. We appreciate everything that you do for us. We really could not do this without you. We thank you for your support. And still, you can't believe what a skeptic I am. I can't believe you believe in that plan. We disagree, but I still give a damn. And we're back with more of This Week in Science. That's right. Look what I found up here on the moon. What'd you, behind, what'd you find behind the moon? I found an American flag on the moon. Ah, oh, amazing. Because I, I didn't pack a blanket, and it gets very cold at night. And then I saw this, <laughs> and I'm like, oh, hey, perfect. <laughs> I love it. Do we have more science? Do you have another science story? I, 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 I have a few, yeah. Let's see. Uh, this is an, I thought this was an interesting story. I caught this on Business Insider, which is not one of the normal places I go for sciencey news. Uh, but I thought this story was a little bit interesting, interesting enough to share here, because it's, it's pointing out something kind of, kind of important about climate change and global warming and the like. And... It starts off, climate change is still a contentious issue. And some people and organizations deny it's even happening. Or concede that the world is getting warmer, but it's not because of humans, right? Um, and it then points out one organization that is not uh, denying global warming's existence, but is in fact preparing heavily for it. Hmm. That organization... The U.S. military. Yes. Right? Yes, they are, yeah. Our Navy is looking at uh, the issue in terms of its threat to national security. It's concerned with the potential for sea level rise to affect naval yards, uh, the, where the fleets dock, where they, where they can travel to. It's opening up some areas. But the climate change is affecting our military readiness in a way. Um, going down to the future. So I just thought that was kind of interesting. That, you know, and it does go on to point out 97% of climate scientists now agree warming trends are very likely due to human activity. The uh, remaining 3%, well, what can you do? It just, it, it's so interesting that the politics of our country can be different than the military of our country than the commerce of our country. I mean, the, all these things, they are their own worlds, their own paradigms, and yeah. So <laughs> no matter... From, no uh, matter uh, Army Brig General John Adams, yeah, uh, retired. He uh, states here, <laughs> talking about the naval, naval uh, yards, they're not floating docks. They're built into the land. <laughs> when the sea level rises above the point where it's safe to berth a Navy ship, you have to change the docking place or the berthing structure itself. Yeah. Yes, you do. Mm -hmm. So this week, uh, Blair isn't here, so I was thinking I could bring some kind of animal cor corner news. You ready? Yeah. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do a Kiki's Animal Corner. Kiki's Animal Corner. With Kiki. Not Blair. Not Blair. <laughs> She's not here. She's not here. All right. So bees. It turns out that um, bees can speak loudly and tell other bees about things. In communication, very often, when you find something good, and you have to tell your other friends about it. Like you find the best new restaurant in town, but you don't want it to like get overrun by other people. You're going to tell your friends and maybe you'll tell them quietly and you'll say, okay, so there's this restaurant. Don't tell anybody that, you know, isn't in our group of friends. And you, you kind of talk quietly. But, you know, if you're out at a cafe or something or you're in public, there are people around you eavesdropping. They're listening in, and all of a sudden they go, oh, what's that? Some, 
a cafe or a restaurant? That sounds awesome. Oh my gosh, it's the new big thing. And the next thing you know, the eavesdroppers, because they eavesdropped, they found out the information, they outnumber your friends at this new restaurant and your whole idea of having this cool restaurant to yourself is busted. This works in the bird, in the bee world as well, in the animal world as well. So when one species of bees or a population of bees finds an awesome source of food, they don't necessarily whisper about it to their friends. Sometimes they shout and sometimes they say it as loudly as possible so as many people as possible will hear. And the researchers who just did this study on some species of bees in Brazil, um, they believe that what's going on when bees shout about their food sources is that they're trying to get so many of their species to go to that food source that it would be a really bad idea for any other species to try and take it over. And so it's kind of this energetic cost-benefit kind of thing where a bee who might be eavesdropping to find out where the sweet honey spot is, um, they that bee will tell their friends if it's told in a whisper, but maybe they won't tell their friends if it's been shouted because they know that that cool bee rest restaurant is just going to be full of people or bees that it doesn't know. So anyway... Eavesdroppers in the bee world make bees shout. It's interesting, right? SMB in Florida in the uh, chat room brings yeah. new meaning to the word buzz. <laughs> you buzz about that new restaurant? <laughs> but very loudly, buzz! <laughs> yeah. I think Blair would have approved of this story, or at least shouty Blair Kevin would have. In the chat room. Shouty bees. <laughs> These are shouty bees. Yeah, but uh, researchers in the animal communication world don't often expect to find shouting of communication signals, especially related to food resources, because you don't want other species to find out about it, especially if there's a lot of competition in your environment for food sources. And so you'd think whispering would be the best, but they looked at these bees in the wild and they actually computer modeled it based on um, economic models. And turns out shouting can be the, the wise way to go about it sometimes. Right. If you're part of a hive or a colony, then it makes sense. It's strength mm -hmm. in numbers. Yes, when that's you, exactly it. Strength in numbers. Or thousands or tens of thousands of brothers and sisters ready to show Rise up there behind up. you. Call the cavalry. Get them here. If you're, you know, one small pack of wolves and you discover, it, hey, you're going to get the word around just fine, very quietly. You don't want to let every other creature in the forest know uh, that you found food. Exactly. That's exactly it. Um, other bee research, uh, turns out that bee foraging is chronically impaired by neonicotinic pesticides. These neonicotinoids um, have been thought to be involved in um, the colony collapse disorder for some time. Exactly how they are involved has been up to some question. Um, one one uh, idea is that it increases the um, or decreases the immune response of the bees so that f a fungus can infect the bee colonies and then uh, cause them to die off. But uh, this research uh, in which down in, um, it was published in Functional Ecology in Guelph, uh, the School of Environmental Sciences, all in conjunction with the Imperial College of London. Um, this study used uh, radio frequency identification tags on bees to find out when individuals left the colony, how much pollen they collected, and from which flowers. So when they left... That's some small technology right there. That's, right? That's just awesome. <laughs> A little RFID tag that probably took into account how much the bee weighed at that particular moment and then where it went in space and so what flower it might have gone to, and then how much it weighed probably would be an indicator of wow, how much pollen. Wow, how do you weigh a flying bee? Like, yeah. 
Is it? No, I'm thinking though. Is it? Is are you are you measuring warbles and its lift off ability? Like how? How in the world would you do that? Methodologically, I don't know, but that's, that's a wonderful right. question. It's great. Yes, it's cool how technology. Measure the weight of a bee in flight. That yeah. sounds like a. That's a big question. That's a tough one. So they got, uh, they treated some colonies with the neonicotinoid uh, pesticides, and then they had other colonies that they did not treat. Untreated colonies, the bees who went out foraging, got better at collecting pollen. They learned to forage, and they improved in their in their pollen collecting. So they'd come back with more pollen the longer they foraged. Those that were treated became less successful over time at collecting pollen. It turns out that these uh, treated colonies also started sending out more bees to forage to try and compensate for the fact that they were not getting as much pollen back. So it's collecting less pollen. Uh, the researcher says the flower preferences of neonicotinoid exposed bees were different to those of foraging bees for untreated colonies. The bees were going to like the wrong flowers. They weren't learning which flowers had the, had more pollen. So bee memory was disrupt, disrupted somewhere. Um, so this is a, this study is a, a real connection between these pesticides, bee behavior, and the potential for the decline of these populations. So um, whether or not it, the, the pesticides directly affect their immune response, they definitely uh, affect the amount of food that the colony can get back and how well the colony can support itself, which then would indirectly link to health and re immune response over time. Hmm. So, well, if, if they can make this firm connection, I bet you this is the quickest ban on a type of pesticide that we've seen because... Since DDT... Since it actually probably happens anymore, quicker but... and more firmly because the farmer relies on bees, mm -hmm. and that's that's their their biggest worker, that's their their unpaid worker that does a ton of the heavy lifting. You know, we it would cost multi billions, maybe a trillion dollars in this state to go out there and hand pollinate crops. You know, it would be ridiculous. It'd just be unfathomable. Uh, couldn't couldn't realistically be done without bees. So, if this connection stands, and this is proven sufficiently in the eyes of uh, agriculture, I bet you see that the, those types of pesticides disappear. Yeah, um, additional study that came out related to these neonicotinoids. Um, it's a Dutch study took place in the Netherlands. Looking uh, from the from 2003 to 2010 at bird species, they found that the population of 15 bird species fell by 3.5 percent annually over that period of time as the pesticides use increased. Um, what they find is that um, insects decreased, which are the birds' food sources, and um, thus the bird populations are declining as a result. So um, this this second study, there's a comment, commentary carried by Nature. Um, a biologist from the Britain's Sussex University said neonicotinoids may well have a long-term impact on insect populations as well because only 5% of the pesticide's active ingredient is absorbed by the crop. The rest goes into the soil and soil water and it can persist for months to years within the soil, and the water. It can take more than 1,000 days for concentrations to fall by half. So these pesticides are being applied liberally and probably being applied much more than they need to be, and they're existing and staying in the soil and the water, affecting insect populations, affecting bird populations, affecting bee populations. It'll be very interesting to see what happens with, this, uh, with these pesticides. The, uh... As I'm looking through it too, I, I found a site that's listing them. Uh, the site itself actually is a year old and has already made the connection with the honeybees. You know, this is April of 2013. Help the honeybees. Here's mm -hmm. a list of pesticides with neonicotinoids. It's from the Center of uh, Center for Food Safety. I got it off of the website beyondpesticides.org. 
And actually, you know, I don't know if it's, I can't tell which of these are industrial scale, right, uh, pesticides, but I can recognize a ton of stuff that is your local nursery, uh, you know. A lot of these, too, they're tree and shrub protect and feed, so they're sort of mixed with uh, plant fertilizer spikes and the like. So a lot of this is your, your backyard gardener, your landscape company likely employing these. So it's, it may not just be the farmer's uh, utilization that's to blame, but everywhere else that the bee may travel. Yeah. You know, and it looks like a lot of, uh, a lot of Bayer Corporation... Uh, and Astra Life Science is another company that seems to be showing up a lot here who are employing these. So uh, might want to might want to reformulate or you know <laughs> drop a few product lines because yeah this this they don't seem to be these don't seem to be so nice at the moment. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency is has been ordered by the White House to carry out its own review of uh, nicotinoids neonicotinoids on bees. Um, so we will see what happens within the United States. Who knows how quickly that kind of review will take place. And while I know it's not, I know it's not the B, the the sex that that Blair usually bl brings to the Blair the Blair Blair's Animal Corner. Let's see if I can get my words together. I've got stuff that's. I don't know, maybe a little shocking. Reanimated spiders. Wait, okay, so spider dies. Spider dies. Then starts moving Brought as though alive -ish? Brought back to life. What? No, like not really spider? brought back to life. Animated, like in a computer animation. Oh. Haha. <laughs> University of Manchester researchers, um, along with Museum for Naturkunde in Berlin, uh, have used fossils from the Natural History Museum in London of a spider, fossil arachnoid, uh, that's approximately 410 million years old. They have published in the Journal of Paleontology, but they have... Um, basically used fossil sections, taken images of these 410 million year old spiders, and then put them together to create and figured out how the spiders would walk and what they would do. And it's a, it's interesting to be able to look at this, uh, look at this reanimation, this graphic presentation of how these old, now dead spider ancestors may have moved and what they would have looked like if they were actually scuttling around in the environment. So I've got a video right here that shows the spiders moving and what they think is that there is a, um, a gate where the first and third feet legs of the spider move and then the second and fourth legs of the spider move on um, on both sides of the spider and I have to say that as I watched it when I first watched this video even though I, I like spiders I see spiders all the time I, I respect spiders there's something about this video that made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up <laughs> <laughs> It's a, it, I don't know, it's a great video. It's really interesting to think. I mean, it, it looks like a spider. It looks like what you would expect a spider to be doing and move, how it, it would be moving around. But it's a, its whole rear abdomen thing looks scaly. I mean, it looks like a cockroach body with spider legs. Yeah, so the, um, the abdomen is definitely um, different looking from the abdomen of... Uh, a modern spider, definitely like it's a segmented body, um, and it's the abdomen is just hovering in the air. The legs, as in all spiders, the legs are attached to the thorax, and um, and the head is a part of the thorax with a couple of little eyes 
on the front and some big petty palps. They've got it's got big fangs. It's just it's it's got big fangs in the front. <laughs> it won't hurt you. Everybody, I give you nightmares. 410 million year old spiders. Do you got more stories, Justin? Uh, I do, I do, I do. Let's see, what do we got? What do we got? Uh, oh, yeah, this is the one that was kind of interesting. This is um, from uh, the University of, I can't pronounce, Ruhr University in Bochum, somewhere in Germany. <laughs> it's actually not just somewhere in Germany. It's like the biggest university, research university in Germany. All right. Uh, which is, you know, because when I first saw this story, I was like, where is this from? Is this from, like, the Naropa Institute of Jack Kerouac Disembodied Poets and Buddha Zen Retreat? Like, where is this, where is this story coming from? Because the, the headline sounds like one of those sort of treatments that aren't really necessarily backed up by science. Headline, Sandalwood Scent. That sandalwood that you would find, uh, you know, lots of burning incenses and stuff. You sandals. I a scent. I'm absolute. I like. It's my the only type of incense I could ever stomach. Really, I like the smell of sandalwood. Sandalwood scent facilitates wound healing and skin regeneration. Hmm. No, come on. Really? This is so weird. How can yeah. a scent facilitate? He healing and regeneration. Yeah, so this is, this is where it gets really strange because it's not just you smell this and somehow this scent triggers an autoimmune uh, response to your body that sends stuff. It's No, the skin cells, there's olfactory receptors in the skin that they found in the course of this study. Skin cells possess an olfactory receptor that happens to be triggered uh, by sandalwood. This is uh, researchers at the Ruhr Universität Bochum. I don't Trigger. know if I'm pronouncing that even nearly how it's supposed to be. Have discovered this. Their data indicate that the cell proliferation increases and wound healing improves if those receptors are activated. The this mechanism constitutes a possible starting point for new drugs, cosmetics, a new thing that you can write <laughs> to sell incense on the outside of the box. Yeah, the team is led by Dr. Uh, Dean Yella Busi and Professor Dr. Medhabil Hans Hat from the Department of Cell Physiology published their report recently in the Journal of Investigative Dermatology. Yeah, so this is interesting. Humans have approximately 350 different types of olfactory receptors in our nose. Uh, the function of those receptors has been shown to exist in other places. Spermatosa. Oh, uh, the prostate, the intestine, the kidneys have scent detectors like those in our nose. Your prostate. Right? Your prostate. <clears throat> I can, I, 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 I love my, you know what, I like the smell. My kidneys can't stand the smell of that. I'm sorry, can you? <laughs> <laughs> can you get rid of that? Perfect. My kidneys, you're bothering my kidneys. And, uh. Spermatozoa? Is that what I think that is? Sperm. Your sperm. My sperm can smell stuff. Your sperm can smell stuff. Which I that no doesn't idea. necessarily that doesn't necessarily surprise me because your sperm are they're tuned to follow chemical signals. So they're gonna be kind of their outside membrane is gonna be covered with with receptors for not just scents, but just chemical signals to get them places to the egg where they want to be. That is wild. So, uh, the, yeah, the researchers studied the olfactory receptors that occur in the skin, discovered that it is activated, in this case, by a synthetic sandalwood scent. Sandalwood aroma frequently used in incense sticks and uh, in perfumes and soaps. It's all over the place. So what did they, like, did they just like waft 
an incense stick around someone's arm or right? like, like did how they, did how did they how did, <clears throat> obviously if they're saying it's scent they're not rubbing sandalwood on the wound or on you know they're not taking it and doing physical contact it's got to be they've got to have some kind of method of knowing that this scent in the air is affecting skin regeneration yeah you think I, so it's, yeah it says uh it says it triggers calcium dependent signal pathways in the skin the pathway ensure increased proliferation and quicker migration of skin cells Processes which typically would increase the ability to heal a wound. <sighs> well, now it gives a it, it, the whole idea of going in for an aromatherapy massage or something. You know, right. if, if there are sandalwood is not the only receptor in the skin. What are the other receptors? Are what other scents is our skin tuned for, and why? Are there some scents that do impact, say, our cortisol levels and our stress response? Oh. So maybe to help, maybe lavender oil, maybe it does actually physically help you relax. Yeah, but you got to be careful, though, because uh, lavender, of course, chemically is a synthetic estrogen. Right. That's going to have <laughs> other effects. Um, <laughs> you know, so, so I mean, we, we are working, look, you know, it, this is one of those things too. It's always well, well, something's all natural, or it's herbal, or it's whatever. Well, we're dealing with a world that is chemicals, and most of our yes. medications and a lot of our chemicals that we utilize derive from a plant source. You know, most of this isn't, com you know, constructed in a lab with only synthetic ingredients, and that's not how. No, it all comes originally from the natural world. It was out there, so things do have effects. Things do work on us. I mm -hmm. think the interesting thing here is that it does it as an olfactory scent. Like the smell uh, on your, to your skin, when your skin reacts to the <laughs> smell of something, yeah. with something that has been identified as an olfactory uh, sensor in the skin, that's something I would not have guessed is taking place. But yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting to see like, what other sense is your skin tuned for like what else could it be reacting to and uh, why the scent of a detergent on your skin even if you haven't contacted it would the smell of bleach in the air possibly have an effect on your skin yeah I'm really but curious why but why I mean I've always with aromas with scent stuff you always think okay it's going to the nose you get your smelling stuff and then it's a, a neural pathway it's stimulating some nerve in your brain, and that's having a secondary response that is going to have an effect down in your body. But this is a direct response. Olfactory receptor in the skin activated, leading to um, the replication of skin cells for skin regeneration, for wound healing, the recruitment of immune cells, possibly. Mm -hmm. um, what what on earth? Why would we evolve that? Gord McLeod in the, in the chat room has a, a, asked this as well. Why would sandalwood trigger that? And how would it evolve? This is so mind-boggling right now. I love it. <laughs> right. So, so, so that's, that's a great question. And, you know, specifically why sandalwood? No ideas are really popping up. Uh, however... Specifically, why would the skin have an olfactory sense that didn't go to the brain directly, right? It right. had a different effect. Well, you know, we have a sense of smell that does inform us quite a bit about the world around us. And at one point in our evolution, it was much, much more important to us really than it is today in terms of being able to smell out for... Uh, predators or prey or food sources or that sort of thing. Uh, but that's conscious brain stuff. It could be there's stuff that the brain's like, you know what? Don't really need your conscious input on this. You know, the body's like, you know what? <laughs> the body's like, I, I, I got this. I, I got I, this. There's a use for this information. Don't even need to bother you about it. You can handle it locally. Don't need the input from the whole big brain hierarchy. It's really a bureaucracy once information goes to the brain. You've got to go through all these different steps before action's taken. You know, we'll just put the olfactory sense right out here on your arm, and uh, if it gets triggered, uh, we'll just handle it. We'll just do it. 
an automated response to the scent. Hmm. I'm trying to figure out where um, where sandalwood incense comes from. Um, it's been is it just it's just wood? It's just it largely sandalwood? it's a type of, it's like a spicy thing. I don't know if it's actually the wood. Spice? What is it? It's I think it grows in a plant in Jordan or something like that. Uh, I, I don't know. According to Wikipedia, sandalwood is the name of a class of fragrant woods from trees in the genus Santalum. The woods are heavy, yellow, and fine-grained, and unlike many other aromatic woods, they retain their fragrance for decades. Sandalwood oil is extracted from the woods for use. The wood and the oil produce a distinctive fragrance, fragrance that has been valued for centuries, or 4,000 centuries, actually. Fascinating. For how long? Uh, about 4,000 years. Huh. For several thousand years. Yeah, at least 4,000 years. So it's been around for a long time in our, uh, in our known use of it. And That's now awesome. we know why. Because it works, people. Because it works. Because it does something. This is just opening up a really interesting, very interesting um, area of research. So now we know our skin, our bodies emit light, and our skin smells. <laughs> well, you're so weird, man. So cool. <laughs> and and, and uh, just in case any of us ever can push it from our memory banks, our faces are covered in tiny mites that live there until they die. That is true. That is true. <sighs> it's all connected. It's all part of a system. We are, a we big are an ecosystem. We are an ecosystem, a meta organism. So, Justin, would you rather sit by yourself very quietly? No. Just thinking. I'll take the other option. Or would you shock I'll take yourself? The other option. Wait, what's the other option? I'll take it. I don't care what it is. Don't delivering, even tell me. Delivering an electric shock. Oh, I would totally rather deliver an electric <laughs> shock than sit here quietly. This is too boring. <laughs> Over the uh, last week, this study was a was a very popular study on the uh, the science science websites out there. I was a little sad at the way it was spun sensationalistically. Um, a lot of headlines related to oh, people would rather deliver shocks than spend time thinking and saying, oh, where are we? What's wrong with our society? Nobody wants to sit quietly and think anymore. They'd rather be distracted by electrical shocks. What's, you know, taking that kind of sensationalistic, pessimistic view. But really, this study was quite interesting. They pretty much gave, put people in a room and they had a device to deliver themselves an electric shock. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Hang on. I might have to change my answer. I, I didn't realize I'd be delivering myself the electric shock. Yep, yourself, oh, not anybody that else. Completely changes my opinion. <laughs> <of what I'm laughs> <doing. laughs> uh, so these Harvard and University of Virginia researchers, they had a bunch of men, a bunch of women. They put them in an empty room and they left them there for 15 minutes and then told them to do nothing, just, just sit there do nothing, um, and then they gave them a, a device to allow themselves to be shocked. Basically, they had a shiny red button that they could press to deliver an electrical shock. They found that um, uh, two-thirds of the men ended up shocking themselves, and a quarter of women did the same. So more men than women delivered themselves an electric shock, I don't know. I enjoy daydreaming. I enjoy thinking about things. I probably could have sat and done nothing for 15 minutes, but if there had been a little shiny red button sitting right there, I probably would have pressed it just to see 
what it would do and how bad the shock would be. I probably would have just pressed it because I was curious. Mm -hmm. I don't know. That's what I, I think I would have. See, I thought this was a sort of somewhat famous experiment about how willing are you to just take orders even though uh, somebody's being physically hurt by it. You know, they got the person in the other room, the instructor tells you to deliver the shock, you hit the button, and you hear the scream from the other room, right? How many right. people would continue to turn up the velocity? I've always, wa I always wanted to pretend that I'd never heard of that and be in one of those experiments. And I would just hold the button down. <laughs> just, just, just because I know some, somebody's been hired as the actor in the other room to make the blood-curdling scream. I was just like, give me your best one. Let me see how well you can deliver on a fake blood-curdling scream, right? But yeah. delivering myself the shock, what I, I, gosh, you know, you know, I, I think I'm with you. Uh, I think I'd have to be like, okay, just, just to find out how, just so I know your, your parameters for your experiment, I just want to, just, I'm going to do it one time just to see where you put the threshold of people being able to handle a shock, right? Mm -hmm. I'm curious. curious. Could I do it? Would I like it? <laughs> <laughs> Would I do it again? Would I do it again? Exactly. Um, so, uh, Replicant XR, X3RO asks in the chat room, were the research subjects all extroverts? It's a question that he's had every time I saw this study. Um, no, they were not all extroverts. They were all different types of people, and the results suggest that those people who were really easily bored had a hard time with this, and you would expect them to have a hard time. They had a hard time with the 15 minutes of doing nothing. People who daydream cope with coped with it much better. So in um, interviews after the fact, the daydreamers were a little bit better at being able to deal with 15 minutes of doing nothing than those who are easily bored. All right. Before before yeah. this start goes any further, I just got a question. What's the record? What's, What's the, the rec record? I don't know. Is it, and is it based on how long you hold it down or how many times you can hit it in the 15 minutes? That's what, that's what I'd like to know before before you start the clock. Is this a time thing? Do I hold down the button <laughs> the longest for the record? Or is it how many times I can hit the button in 15 minutes? Uh, Which am I going for? Because I'm, I'm planning on winning this thing. I want to be number one. I want to be number one. I want to win. Number one. When I leave this room, I want yes. all of you to remember, hey, remember that guy who came into the room and totally owned the button and <laughs> broke the record and nobody's ever hit the button nearly as insanely often for, or for as long as that guy. I want you all to remember my name going forward. Schnago in the, ch in the chat room says, assuming a university study, this just reinforces the findings of all psych studies. College students are idiots. <laughs> no. And yes, Kurt, I, mean, I, I do think this so much. You've got to leave community. me out of your data. That's how often. <laughs> I want to be the, you're the outlier the data point outlier that you're like, you know what? We're going to have to drop that, that extreme off and drop off the extreme low or whatever. You know, you take a couple of those parameters out so it doesn't too heavily skew the data. I want to be that guy. I want to make sure I'm that guy. <laughs> Do you have any more stories? One more that is actually exceedingly important, should have led with it, most important story of the week. What? This is the biggest story in science this week, and where did I get it from? Uh, I got it from the Salk Institute for Biological Studies. Uh, they researched the research, studied the studies, and uh, published in Cell Stem Cell Journal. The this is this is having to do with the ability that we've had for some time to switch out one gene and put another gene into a living stem cell from one uh, living stem cell to another uh, and and one of the fears is hey when we do all this gene splicing you know when you take edited genes and use them for different purposes what will happen when the children of those stem cells are mutated and turns into ah it turns out there are no mutants. 
the no, our ability to splice in genes, engineering uh, stem cells to, you know, whether it's uh, engineering a virus to deliver a new gene to a cell or however we're doing it, not creating mutants, not creating mutant genes. It's doing basically what we've instructed them to do. It's working. And that's not saying that there are, like, no mutations whatsoever because all cells get mutations over time. There yeah. is a mutation rate that is to be expected. It's just that these... There are no harmful mutations taking place. There's nothing different. There's no different rate of mutation. Right? It's not like, oh, the virus is putting in its own weird thing. No. Yeah. So, uh, awesome. basically... We're free to use them! Working... Yeah, let's use those stem Science cells. Winning therapies being unlocked, uh, new possible treatments for every kind of disease out there. Just about pretty much everything uh, is on the table. Perfect. Science is winning. Science is winning. Um, I had another study that's not an, another couple of stories that are not the biggest stories of the week, but also very interesting. Researchers discovered that. Um, that genes, that our genome sometimes gets frame shifted when transcription takes place. And it's not an accident. It seems like it's on purpose. Um, these researchers found a messenger RNA that kind of gets in the works 10 to 15 percent of the time when um, the immune system is turned on for a particular protein. And so transcription is the process. Basically in your genome, your DNA, you have a certain uh, instruction that comes in and it's a start codon and then transcription starts at the start part of the codon and it goes all the way to the end until there's a certain signature that's called the stop codon and that's where transcription of the gene ends. That gene transcript is then taken as messenger RNA to um, the ribosomes where they are turned from RNA into from messenger RNA into proteins that do all sorts of work in our cells. In this particular case, there's this little bit of RNA that gets in the way and causes the gene transcription to start two to three base pairs later. So if you had, for instance, a sentence that you were reading and, and you know what all these letters are and you had to start reading it two to three letters over, all of a sudden you'd be reading gobbledygook right? Yeah. So in this case, what happens is 10 to 15 percent of the time, this gene is transcribed as junk, as gobbledygook that means nothing, and it gets thrown out with the trash. And the researchers think that this frame shifting is actually part of the system of the immune system and modulating the immune system's response so that something like inflammation, which can get out of control if it's not moderated, actually is decreased. The effect is decreased because of this frame shifting. They think it's not an accident, and they think that it is something that our genome has evolved to do in spe specific situations. So, so they're looking for more examples of it. Frame shifting. It happens. Brilliant biological activity. Yeah. It's like the system programmed in mistaking, making mistakes so that it wouldn't be too good at its job. It's crazy. And then uh, my final story is that researchers are using the uh, LINAC um, coherent light source down here at uh, the Livermore National Labs. Not Livermore, I'm sorry. It's, what's um, uh, the, I'm blank, S, the Slack. The Slack source, Stanford Linear Accelerator, is what it used to be, but National Lab down in Palo Alto, Slack, they have a LINAC linear accelerator that is um, being used. This light source produces x-rays that can take pictures at the femtosecond scale, so 10 to the minus 15th, basically allowing people to take molecular level pictures and researchers from the University of Arizona along with these Slack um, LINAC people are um, have taken pictures of photosystem 2 from 
the photosynthetic array in plants. They're taking pictures of it with the end goal of making a little molecular movie of photosynthesis taking place. The splitting of water. And they've gotten a couple of pictures already. They've got some snapshots of photos photosynthesis in action. And they say that there's a, an expanding of one part of the uh, molecular machinery, which is thought to take place so that water can fit in into that spot and then be split apart. And so they're taking little pictures of how photosynthesis actually works. We're getting real pictures. Which I, really I guess we don't exactly know the We have a really good chemical guess. Chemical process. Yeah. Yeah, we don't know. We guess, haven't seen it idea. happen. If we can witness this. And, if, the, and the thing is, the thing is, too, this is, wow, this is a process by which you can release some hydrogen from water. Yes, exactly. This if, is a process which, if we learn how to do synthetically, if we learn yes. how to accomplish this in the unnatural world of man, we can turn water into energy. We can turn salt water into electric cars, fuel cell cars. Um, if we can nail what plants have been doing for three billion years on planet Earth, uh, we can evolve our technologies. Absolutely. So this is really, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing from these researchers later when they have completed their movie of photosynthesis. That'll be exciting. Yeah. I totally want tickets to that opening night. That's right. I want tickets to that show. <laughs> All right, everybody. Are you done with stories, Justin? I think I got I think I got the uh the stories that I was shooting for here this week and we are wow, we did we went way over the time. Oh my goodness. We started a little late. Yeah. It was a good week. It was a good week for yeah, science. Yeah, a full week. It was a full week. I had a hard time cutting it down. So anyway, I would love to give some shout outs to our Patreons. Thank you so much for supporting us on Patreon, patreon.com slash thisweekinscience. Kevin Donald Wesley Ballard, Bo Hartwig, Gary Williamson, Rudy Garcia, Matthew Litwin, Eric Knapp, Mark, Jason Roberts, Patrick Cohn, Jason Dozier, Shane and Tara Ginsburg, Brian Condren, Byron Lee, Lord Trenton, Trentonian Moody, E.O., Ulysses Adkins, Jared Lysette, Paul D. Disney, Bob Calder, Don Kamarichka, Violated Gorilla, Tony Steele, Ed Dyer, Charlene Davidson Henry, Marshall Clark, Layla Amir Sadegi, Nick Gradwell, Adam Mishkan, Craig Porter, Alec Doty, James, Dan Rambo, Iluma Lama, Tuomas Maikinen, Paul West, Jason Olds, TMRO, Ben Rothig, Gary Swinsberg, Jason Martin, Miko Pakula, John Specht, Dougal Campbell, Larry Garcia, Tyler Harrison, Jurgen Stellingwerf, Philip Shane, Marjorie, Lauren Lang, and Gordon Grant. Thank you so much for your support on Patreon. We could not do this without you. On next week's show, once again, we're going to be broadcasting live online, 8 p.m. Pacific time at twist.org slash live, and you can watch live and join our chat room. Join our chat room. It's so much fun in there. But don't worry if you can't make it. I understand there's a lot of competition for Thursday evenings. You can find our past episodes at youtube.com slash thisweekinscience or our audio files at twist.org. Don't forget to tell a friend about Twist. Check out our Patreon page, patreon.com slash thisweekinscience. Yeah, we are $68.90 an episode away from reaching our next milestone goal with Patreon. We're almost there. So if you haven't, sign up. If you know somebody who should, get them to sign up. If they haven't heard our show before, get them to sign up and then have them listen to our show so they know why they signed up for the Patreon. And thank you, everybody, for listening. We hope you enjoyed the show. Twist is also available as a podcast. Just Google This Week in Science in your iTunes directory, or if you have a mobile listening device, you can look for Twist 4 Droid. That's Twist the number 4 Droid app in the Android Marketplace, or for Twist, T-W-I-S, in the Apple Marketplace. 
For more information on anything that you've heard here today, show notes are going to be available at our website, twist.org. You can also make comments and start conversations with other people and the show hosts. Yeah, absolutely. Or you can contact us directly. Email Kirsten at Kirsten at ThisWeekInScience.com, Justin at TwistMinion at Gmail.com, or Blair at BlairBaz at Twist.org. Just be sure to put Twist, T-W-I-S, somewhere in the subject line, or your email will get spam filtered into oblivion. You can also hit us up on the Twitter, where we are at TwistScience, at Dr. Geeky, at JacksonFly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that came to you in the night, please let us know. And we'll be back here next week. And we hope that you will join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from today's show, remember... It's all in your head. This week in science... This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. This week science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth. And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got one disclaimer, and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views, but I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science, you may just yet understand that we're not trying to threaten your philosophy. We're just trying to save the world from jeopardy. Jeopardy, jeopardy. And this week in science is coming your way. So everybody listen to everything we say. And if you use our method instead of rolling a die, we may rid the world of toxoplasma. Got the eye. Because it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 Got a laundry list of items I want to address From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got But how can I ever see the changes I seek When I can only set up shop one hour a week? This week in science is coming your way You better just listen to what we say And if you've learned anything from the words that we've said Then please just remember it's all in your head Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. science. This week in science This week in science this week in science, 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 science. This week in science, this week in 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 science. Booyah! We are now part of the after show, and I will read the intro again so that we can get that recorded. Reading the intro in five, four, three, two. This is Twist, 
This Week in Science, episode number 472, recorded on Thursday, July 10th, 2014. Science is never over. I'm Dr. Kiki, and today on This Week in Science, we're going to fill your head with Neanderthal earbones, reanimated spiders, and stinky skin. But first... Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Yeah, I'm just having deja vu right now. <laughs> I, I, what? I, yes. Wait, did I just come back? What's I'm happening? I, mean, I just showed up in time for the show, and yet I also feel like we just did the show. I'm very confused right now. We just did the show, and we're going to do it again. Again and again and again and again. Thanks, CR1 bestest show on the internet. That's right. awesome. Bestest audience in all of the internet. Bestest audience. Yay! Minion of Twists. Really good science class. Yay! Oh, good yeah. night, Ed. I'm sorry you can't make the after show. Good night, ah. Ed. Encore. <laughs> Which stories did I cut out? You cut out a... From tonight? Story. Yeah, which ones didn't make the cut? That's uh, oh, that's a good question. There's one question, I, was, uh, right? I was playing with doing that I didn't do, but I don't have it here. But it was about um, a bunch of scientists uh, voicing concern over microplastics in the oceans, something that we just talked about on this show. Which uh, is super recently. important. Yeah. Um. Yeah, there was something that was really interesting about uh, more, effic more efficient solar panels. But I didn't understand. I don't understand enough about electron holes and like there's. I needed. There was more work that needed. And to be done HIV to baby. That. We didn't put the HIV. The, we baby didn't put in, the though. HIV baby in. Yeah. Note to people: sad story. Four-year-old baby has HIV. Well, and was uh, treated, and for two years, no sign of the HIV. Success, yeah, success, then, success. And yeah. now new results are showing. Oh look, it's uh, still there. Are we finding it? But the it's lower, uh, a lower rate. So still not an unsuccess. Just not the the positive uh, headline. If you're only just hearing the story, is uh, treatment nearly cures child of HIV. Nearly. Nearly. <laughs> almost. Nearly eradicates HIV from. Nearly from almost. Um, it's one thing on this show that we do kind of avoid and have avoided for the decade plus that the show's been on is doing uh, heavy, going heavily on the cancer or HIV cure stories. You know, we, we did do a little on the vaccine early on, which is now showing uh, it's not working. There was perhaps even outright fraud in the research. Uh, so, and part of the reason is so there's so much new uh, headlines generated about potential cures, pathways to cures, opening up horizons for research into further research for cures in the future, that it's always preliminary, and I'm just waiting for the, aha, we got it, before, and then at that point it won't be news because it's reported, every one of these milestones does get reported somewhere. Uh, to a great extent, but yeah, it'll get reported elsewhere. It's just oh it's yes, just... that's the other story. Rights for robots: the U.S. smallpox vials found in a cardboard box in a freezer. Mm -hmm. It's like samples of smallpox have been sitting in an unsecured freezer for like forty years. No, and they First were just all. found. Researchers were like, "Oh, that's what those were." Whoops. Yeah. So Labeling. when I talk to when I talk to scientists and they tell me that no, the system is perfect. There's no accidents. Nothing slips out. You know what? You know what? You take your flu virus study and you stick it in a level four facility right now, people. That's all I gotta say. <laughs> yeah. Um. There's always the potential for, yeah, interesting. Uh, you ever hear of something called valley fever? Yes. My dad had valley fever when he was a kid. 
Really? Okay, mm -hmm. so this is like a fungal infection. He had to act, they actually took him to Pacif Pacific Grove, like on the coast when he was a kid to live there for a while. Yeah. So, and yeah, you're sort of in part of the hotbed if he was in the Stockton area, also mm -hmm. prevalent in the Fresno, Bakersfield sort of. Stockton. Mm -hmm. He was in central, Fresno. Uh, sort of a central and central southern California, central Californian uh, disease brought about by a fungal, a fungus. So those are where the hot spots are. Also, it uh, has popped up somewhere along the Pewter Creek area. Oh, dear. Yeah, so somewhat somewhat nearby. Yeah. It uh, also happens to be that it is studied at UC Davis. So I don't want to say that there's a connection. I don't want to say it. Right. It's... it's there's no no link, nothing connecting it necessarily. Nope. Can't you say there's a connection. It it's just a coincidence. It is That's a coincidence until proven yeah, otherwise. Carry on. Nothing to see here. They're interesting, aren't they? <sighs> and I do want to apologize for people to people. I think John Ratnaswamy was waiting for his name to be read, and I think I read the wrong list of patrons. It's a month old, so your name was not on that particular oh, list. No. So John Ratnaswamy, thank you so much for your donation. Thank you. There are other people on that list as well, and I don't I just know that all sorts of great names here. This is the list that I need for okay, so I have to remember. Manage rewards list. <laughs> whiskey renegade. <laughs> what did Oh whiskey renegade? <laughs> What are we to do? Changing things. I'm adding things while I sit here. There's so many there's so much stuff out there. So many interesting stories and We are we are so close. We are so close to our goal here at 500 mm -hmm. though. We are. It's pretty awesome. Yeah. Very excited. Oh, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. I completely, I can't believe I forgot about this. What? 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 So, um, <laughs> what? I was interviewed. I don't know how it's going to come out. On, awesome. And I don't know if I will actually be a part of the final story, but I was interviewed by Grace Rubenstein from California Report, KQED's. Um, California thing uh, for California Magazine, California Report Magazine. So, um, Wait, so it's in print? No, it's in audio. It's an okay. audio interview, and the it interview, should be. You never, yeah, you're, you're. Yeah. And so, if you go, if you look up California Report KQED online. And then you can find out where, let's see, tune in is the link at the top. And you can find out within California at least uh, where, what stations run the California report and when they run it. And so I believe that tomorrow evening, um, if you're in the Sacramento area, um, wait, really? That station doesn't run it. Here, let me look at Sacramento. Friday, 4.30, 6.30, and 11 p.m. on KQEI. KJ, KXJZ runs it Friday at 6.30 p.m. in Sa Sacramento. But I was interviewed to talk about Patreon. Oh. And Twiss for California Report. No way. Yes. Oh, that's brilliant. Yes. So, fingers crossed that we'll get a few more listeners and... People who want to hear about sciencey stuff, and then possibly a few more Patreons. Would be kind of cool. Would be, be kind totally of cool awesome. to see that come out of it. It would be totally yeah. So tomorrow afternoon, nighttime. There are several times that you can catch it, um, and then I then there's the podcast also that you can. That you can get. So I don't know exactly when the podcast comes out, when the when that's involved. Not sure about that. But anyway, if there's a link, if I get sent a link, I will I will be sharing it around for sure. 
but I think it sh I think it'll go out tomorrow night, maybe next week, but it'll happen definitely very soon. Yeah. What are all these? Are you guys scoring each other? Are you who's keeping track of all these plus ones and plus twos and things? Are you guys keeping track of that? What are you talking about? Throughout the show, in the chat room, they've been like plus one-ing and plus two-ing. They've been like scoring each other on different comments, I think. I, I think, I think it's they have a game going or something. World's version of a high five <laughs> is what that is. Plus one. That's nice. Plus one. Plus one. Oh yes, Lego has revealed their minifigures. This is a great, great story. They said they were going to do female scientist minifigures, and they have done it. I They've want the Lisa Randall. Them. I call the Lisa Randall one. <laughs> they released the prototype of the final set to the original designer, Ellen Kuijiman. A.K.A. Alateriel Elensar, who posted images of the box and parts on her blog. So it looks like that's cool. Research Institute, new Research Institute set, so cool. Paleontologist, a chemist, an astronomer, with instruments or examples of their work. Uh, if if any of them has red hair, we're gonna have to repurpose it to be a, a Kiki. Right, a Doctor Kiki. That's exactly right. it. It'll be the Doctor. I'm sure Kiki there's logo. already a zookeeper Lego. Mm-hmm. We could turn into a Blair. And then I call I call uh, pirate. <laughs> the new research institute astronomer with her gray blazer and fuchsia scarf looks like. Lisa Randall. Awesome. I can't wait to see them. To be able to purchase them and send them. That is a one cranky face on that Lisa Randall, though. No. There's some happy faces. There's some interesting... Yeah, they've repurposed some of the Lego character heads, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so I like this kind of... These sweaters, what are these sweaters that they have these female scientists wearing? Those are interesting. Well, these are the next Clothing generation. that screams scientist. Maybe. Are these the next generation Lego figures? Are these like the new girly Legos? Girly Legos. <laughs> no, they have. They made them, they have like more features. They do. Really the clothing. Yeah, they've got they've got more features. One of them has a little a mole. Another one that they all have kind of curvy waists. They're curvy like women. Funny though, I I got to start wearing a neckerchief. Neckerchief. <laughs> I do. What is this? A blazer and a little neckerchief scarf. It's jaunty. It's what scientists do. Mm. No, kids. This is what female scientists do. Uh -huh. <laughs> Who said anything about being a superhero scientist Lego figure? That's what I want to do. Ah, replicant just like Google+. Plus. Nice. It's a programmer programming thing. Iterate by one. <laughs> it started with video games and gamers. Interesting. The plus one. Nice. But now that Google Plus does the plus one, oh, make everything is Google Plus. What you doing over there? I'm trying to find. I still can't find the Lego science chick thing. Hmm? I can't find. Put, give me somebody. Oh, here we go. The strengths. Put somebody put the, the strengths. Room, put the link now. in there. Yeah. Mm. 
Oh, now I got an ad site. I gotta wait. Hmm? Oh, I can hit a button and I can go there now. Okay. Ah, more pop the apps. Da, da, da. There they are. I don't know. So these are classic. These are just classic Legos. Mm-hmm. This isn't the... Uh, yeah. This isn't the, the new generation ones. These are these are pretty classic, but uh, what is it with these faces? Ah, mm, ah. I can't wait to see these. These are gonna be cool. Good, you couldn't hear me sucking on my chocolate. Any any boing news? Uh, I got a an email from Mark late weekend saying I haven't forgotten about you. I'll be getting back to you, but I haven't heard from him this week. So the boingy boingy may still happen. We are just waiting to hear from them. Get the details. Make it. And work. again, yeah. What will we be boinging? I don't know. He probably has to talk to his ad people and you know see how it you know transferring over what it'll what they'll need and. But the the guy you're talking to, if I know if if I understand this right, is the creator. Of Boing Boing. Of Boing Boing. It's not like we're yeah. talking to. Along with David Peskovitz and Corey Doctor. There or a you know under overling over underling. Nope. Side winger. Nope. It's it's Mark. You've got you've got the direct line to the originator of the Boeing. It's like having a direct phone to God. Okay. Well, this is cool. That's exciting because they sure know how to drive traffic much better than we do. Hmm. <laughs> Strengths has a genetic memory story. Ooh, I love those. I love those. What's that story? Down with pandas. What? Is that link bait? Did you get me to click? Yeah, Rick Ross. Load it. There was an error loading this community. Darn you, Firefox. Do it. Do it, Firefox. Do it. There we go. Which one? Beer Shiva. Mm, scorpions are master architects. Ben Gurion University of the Negev scientists have discovered that scorpions create a platform in their burrows where they warm up before the evening hunt. Hmm. It's like the warming. It's like their their sunbathing pad, but it's just the the heat bathing pad. Oh, so, yeah, and then there's the go gorilla odor communication. That's cool, uh, too. I like that Stinky stuff. gorillas. Stinky gorillas. Smelling with their skin. But I wonder... We've got these little smelly smell receptors all over the place in, in internal organs. Like, there are things like... Spermatozoa, where it makes sense because they're like chemically directed and they take those hints and they follow them down to get to the egg. But then hairy animals, if your hair is covered up, hair, hair is covering up your skin and making it difficult for smells to permeate. Mm -hmm. That's what I just, it's, I want to know more about the stinky skin. And oh, yeah. if, and the electric eel genome. That one was a cool story last week that I didn't get to talk about. If somehow one were to get their own spermatozoa somewhere on their skin, would we then be smelling ourselves? Yes. 
kind of. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> but you can do that more easily. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But my I don't feel like my armpit is smelling me back. No, yeah, but no. That's, that's right. That's, that's like it's mutual smelling of yourself. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mutual smelling. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Whiskey Renegade. If we end up on Boing Boing, all of you will be watched by the NSA. I think that's what that oh, means. Um, mm -hmm. Yes. Sorry, you already are. You already are. But it's a good thing. You're being watched over, right? It's like NSA is like a kindly, well-meaning neighbor who is very into the neighborhood watch um, and is watching everyone all the time. It's a good thing. It's a warm thing. It's a good feeling it's, it's to good. know that somebody's watching all the time. They're always watching you. That's right. This is one of those things that. Watching this is one of those things you. that. Um, when these stories about the NSA first broke, I had no problem with it. I love my NSA. I trust my NSA. My my no such agency agency is the one agency above all agencies that I have a warm fuzzy feeling for. Yeah? yeah. Warm and fuzzy? Yeah. They're they're the good guys. It's it's sort of like our our math nerds against, you know, the evils that be in the world. It's the code breakers. It's the in information gatherers. You know, these are these are the good guys in a world where information prevents uh, actual military action from having to take place. Having a strong intelligence community prevents humans, of which I am one, uh, humans from dying and killing each other and fighting in these horrific wars. Uh, the more details that get sussed out, Dark, the more I'm like, ooh, okay, a little less comfortable with this, a little less comfortable with that, a little too much of the, uh, <laughs> there's, there's like a bad, one of the recent releases, it just has a little negative element to it. Um, and... And they they use some racially di uh, derisive language in an example, and like sort of a training example of how to use the system to employees. God, I just found a shirt that I need to buy for Blair right now. <laughs> Go to work shirtwoot.com right now. Blair needs this shirt. You told to look up a word. Good because I don't know what that word's. I have to buy this. Is other Blair than it looks like it means pants up. Now, Let's take a look. How do I get it? I want this for Blair. What size is she? Women's medium, you think? I'll just do women's medium. That's probably a safe bet. She's not large. Did you see it? No. What do you? What is, uh, Did you see this Woot shirt? The what? Huh, 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 shirt it? for Blair. Uh, Woot Woot shirt. I'm still stuck on Penopticon. 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 I like that word. Penopticon. Uh. Panda is my spirit animal. Yeah. Isn't that a good one. Worthy. Why do you have to make me log into things? I don't want to be a member of your stuff. Right. And I don't have Amazon payments. What are you talking about? Can I just do this? They just made this so hard. <laughs> Panopticon. I think there's a somewhere. 
Oh, yeah, yeah. Giant virus might have been the uh, first life on Earth. I think we covered that one a long time ago, Strength. The giant, the ancient giant viruses. The Mimi virus? I mean, mine? Wait, that's George. The Mimi virus? They call, I think that one. Log in with Amazon. I don't think I have Amazon payments. Uh, yes, Whiskey Renegade. The NSA actually is a black budget funded organization. Uh, our government is actually the only such black budgeted organization that I'm aware of. Elements of the CIA may be black budgeted here and there, but the entire budget of the NSA uh, had been, at least, completely off the books so as to not alert the enemies that might be uh, what we're actually spending on that sort of intelligence. You know, and, and the NSA does a fantastic job. I mean, we don't get to hear about it because they don't say... Uh, today, the NSA broke up this, that, and the other thing, which they'll probably start doing, realistically, having to explain what it is that they do. The plots that they uncover, the criminal nefarious activities uh, that they suss out and prevent from taking place in and around and about this country. But, you know, I mean, without... Without really strong intelligence, it's like, you know, the decisions you make, you make in the dark, whatever policy it may be. And the terrifying thing to me is they're talking about placing it under more civilian control, meaning elected officials. If, if the antics of Washington haven't already convinced you <laughs> that... that that civilian influence can be exceedingly partisan. Uh, then, then you haven't been paying attention. It's it's too too scary. I, I like it as a information collector. I think it's been less invasive than people may think. Although there have been some Americans targeted now that information is coming out. That sounds like it should be more the realm of an FBI or something of that nature. Um, not an NSA, because it's not their jurisdiction. It's actually against the charter. There may be too much of an overreaction to the details that we have heard. Too much of a fear of an invasive big brother, uh, which is a legitimate fear, and which does need to be controlled. And civil liberties do need to be upheld. And privacy needs to be upheld. But we live in a world, too, where, at least in the United States, you have to assume that this nation is a target across the spectrum from business to physical infrastructure and financial and everything else. We are we're a big target for a lot of countries. And we want a really strong, robust National security agency that's focused on the task of defense. You want that? Did they overstep? Did they overreach? Quite possibly. How much? Did you so? know? We don't really know. Did you know that you can use the tin foil or the aluminum foil from your chocolate wrappers as a hat? And then the harp signal won't be able to alter your <laughs> moods. Make you consume. Good. You can collect the aluminum foil, right? Aluminum's not tin, though, people. Not the same. That harp signal. Come on, Woot, you take so long. Am I not going to get a t-shirt for Blairla? <clears throat> yes. Yes. I win. The panda is Blair's spirit animal. She now gets a t-shirt. Yeah, I wanted to. I wanted to be in the NSA when I was a kid. You wanted to be in the NSA. Yeah, uh, as a kid, I I wanted to be. And I'm talking 12, 11, 12, 13 years old. I thought the NSA was where I was going to be because I was reading books. I was really inter I was really interested in cryptography uh, as a fascinating. kid. Fascinating. 
Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, creating codes to communicate information, and then the back and forth. You know, I read all about the Enigma program, the different techniques that were used in the wars that really, you know, brought about a distinct advantage to the Allies of having broken codes. Basically, the way people make messages secret and send it back and forth. You break the code, you can hear what the enemy's saying. That intelligence, that information, allows you to make decisions with a distinct advantage. And that, to me, was that sounded like the coolest thing ever. You know, this is also the height of the Cold War. Well, actually, by twelve, it was starting to recede a bit. But this was still it was raised in a big chunk of the Cold War, where I expected as a kid at some point, U.S. and Russia were going to launch intercontinental ballistic missiles at each other and wipe the planet clean of life. Right. This was, it seemed, very plausible solution at the time. Uh, and so the idea that there was this whole organization out there, eavesdropping, listening, monitoring the world's communications, breaking codes, it was just like working with puzzles. It sounded like fun, for one thing. But then the ultimate result was, as long as we knew what the enemy was saying and thinking, we could prevent uh, a war from happening. And so this has always been my perspective of the NSA as a monitoring system of code breakers that try to prevent bad things from happening in the world. And they're not a themselves, while they're funded by the military, they're not an outfit that has a command structure as such that it can, that it has a, an armed uh, group Right. Mili- you know, they don't have their own military that they can Except send. Except now, aren't they being? Is the NSA being? Or I mean, is who's doing the who's doing the military? Um, like hacking other countries' databases. Who's doing that? Well, we should be. Uh, we but, are. We've got people doing that. But but the, and then the main We're focus house. of of the NSA has become game theory. Which was a ma- which the beautiful mind story, right? It's a mathematical theorem. Cyber command. That dictates that if everyone is looking out for their own self-interest, right? It's a very scientific, mathematical, algorithmic concept. Game theory dictating if all the players are looking out for their own self-interest, you can sort of determine the outcome based on being able to project the moves that they will make uh, in their own best interest at any given time. So... This theory has proved exceedingly useful and functional in foreign relations. And what it requires is data, and the data it requires is the motivations of individual players. So being able to, yeah, know what the Chancellor of Germany's motivations are by eavesdropping, incredibly important to get those plugged in. It's a major player in the global economic and military and industrial what's-it complexes, and the ebbs and flows of things, knowing what's going on in the, the minds of... Uh, Iranian leadership, uh, business leadership there, everything else. These are all things that the NSA needs to plug into their game theory to predict the future of the world. And in doing that, and making those predictions, we can say things like, well, it's not actually necessary to invade this country because from everything we can tell, they're satisfied in their region and just trying to maintain a local thing. It's not going to be expanded. So all of these things are exceedingly important to maintaining national security, global security. Uh, A little bit of Big Brother is necessary now with restraints. And part of the problem I have with the the solution to the overreach uh, by the NSA is that they're talking about creating more civilian control and oversight, which is something that had previously happened to the CIA. And what we saw there was the civilian, meaning the executive branch, the White House, being able to step in and interfere with normal data collection and assessments of a place like, say, Iraq and the situation with WMD and cherry-pick the data that made it through. Civilian influence with an agenda got to change the information the Central Intelligence Agency had collected on the ground. We will use this, we won't use that, we'll leave this out, we'll put this one even in, even though it isn't really being backed up or satisfied the level of credibility to the intelligence agency. Civilian uh, agendas can trump good, hard, solid 
intelligence would. And that's yeah. why I'm really afraid of an NSA having more oversight. Hmm. That's interesting. I wonder, though, if my computer crashed, if I could call them up and get a backup. <laughs> Say, please. Yeah, NSA hotline. Uh, yeah, yeah uh, well, my mouse was working a minute ago. Now it's not, and I can't get to this site. Uh, do I ex approve spying on our allies in order to take advantage of them in international commerce? No. So here's one of the things. This is one of the problems of, of civilian oversight. Civilian oversight means politician oversight. Politicians have commercial financial backers. They do. They have donors from specific industries. So if they, if they had access to use something like NSA to suss out specific economic data and supply it to specific companies, it both trumps their ability to do business against the other companies within our country, let alone over there. That's not the kind of thing we want our NSA doing. What we want our NSA doing is spying on the motivations of leaderships uh, across the world so that we can plug them into the game theorem uh, matrix and be able to predict their opinions on other things as well as outcomes, eventual trends in a country, whether it be for, against, this, that, or the other types of uh, policies. And it's incredibly important. The other thing to, to keep in mind, too, is Germany, for instance, is a great example. They have an intelligence department that spies on foreign countries, including the United States, and they actually are part of, they don't have to report to any sort of uh, judicial system, which internally we do at the NSA. They don't have ever, they don't ever report to the leadership of the country. They don't have to. And they have their own, you know, a lot of these countries, especially like France, for instance, again, doesn't report to the, the leadership in France. They don't they have their own military actually branch of their intelligence that can go off and perform things and do stuff out of the loop of leadership these are things that the NSA doesn't have and isn't designed for and isn't built so any foreign country that says you spied on us but we don't have spies that are okay Uzbekistan maybe we spied on Uzbekistan and Uzbekistan doesn't have operatives in the United States trying to collect data Sorry, Uzbekistan, you're not in the game, and yet, by default, you, you made our list. Uh, France, Germany, major powers, major economic powers, please, they're all involved in data collection. I'm shopping. <laughs> I started shopping on Woot. This is no good. This is no good. The Hoover oversight method, right, works. No, it's civilian oversight isn't going to keep the NSA from blackmailing every elected official to do its bidding. That's judicial oversight. Civilian oversight tries to get the NSA would would ultimately, I think, try to get the NSA to dig up dirt on its political opponents. The civilian you have to understand, whenever we're saying civilian oversight, we're talking about politicians. We're talking about Democrat, Republican, Tea Party, Green Party, whoever's in charge being able to make the calls uh, on how NSA is implemented. That's dangerous. You, I, I, you know, if you have a judicial branch, you know, that may be a, may be a better scenario. And if you don't trust, trust your judicial branch, or your military branch, or your civilian branch, then yes, the black helicopters are coming from the UN to take over the South. We are that's we seceded. We sold the and and part of NAFTA was selling the South of the United States to the UN. And black helicopters will come any day now and take your guns and and force you to have a different religion. But if you don't really believe that, then yeah, the NSA has been doing a heck of a job. Heck, heck of a job. Heck. And it doesn't mean they're spying oh, on everyone. Data collection, in this metadata is is designed to be able to look back once there's a, a good investigation and say, okay, well, who's calling who? And it turns out 
yeah, that deli shop in New Jersey gets uh, three calls a week from Iran. Chances are they're not ordering sandwiches, right? Turns out maybe it is somebody's got a cousin back there, and they're just keeping in touch with the family. But you know, these are the things that uh, that a country should be looking out for in this day and age. You know, we're a target. Your infrastructure. If you're in the United States, your infrastructure is a target. Your people are targets. You know, we we would we are targets either economically or physically out for reasons of terror to fulfill somebody else's. Uh, recruitment quotas you know uh, we we are a target we do need a national security agency I don't know maybe I've watched too many world war movies it's very possible the Turner network was very popular with me when I was going it is possible yeah but we have come to the brink many times of globally losing control of civilizations to despots, dictators, and fanatical regimes. You know, and it's not over yet. I mean, we you can act like you can act like the world has solidified. You know, especially on a show like This Week in Science, man, it feels like we live in a civilized society. It feels like the planet is brilliantly gone far beyond the you know blow you up for your religion <laughs> mentalities. But it's taking place right now in many parts of the world. It's an active, evolving threat that hasn't gone away. Most of the world, most of the world is tied to ridiculous ideology. Even, even somewhat here at home. I mean, we're not immune. We have all sorts of ridiculous ideology here at home. I mean, we have, I think a lot of the ideal ideology here at home has to do with trying to make money or something. I don't know. Or so, so I've made this big pitch for why the NSA is the most awesome organization on, on, on the planet because it preserves the peace and keeps World War III from happening. However, as I said before, there have been details that have sussed out that that's not supposed to be part of my NSA. And, and... Post Snowden, there have been a lot of would-be uh, whistleblowers that have been revealed. People who were long-term, lifelong NSA employees who said, "Yeah, I tried to speak out about what was going on, got drummed out of the NSA." So there is a, you know, there is perhaps a self-correcting mechanism that is taking place. That is forcing some of these issues to the forefront that shouldn't have come to this point. And again, you know, as much as I'm afraid of civilian uh, oversight, we have humans at the helm everywhere. There's humans running everything. There's human beings running every aspect of government and society uh, that the robots haven't automated, haven't been automated to... Uh, Not the humans! Right? No. There's going to be, there's gonna be failures. There's going to be uh, judgments and that sort of thing that take place. But you know, I'm it's all about perspective, really, people. Yeah, I'm reading a really interesting uh, series of books. Let me see if I can. Neil Asher is the sci-fi writer. I'm reading Neil Asher, the Paulet Polity books, Agent Cormac. Really good, but um, basically within the polity, it, Earth is humans are expanding out throughout the universe, and the polity is basically the political government that rules everyone. And there are separatists who try and don't want to be ruled, and they want to have their freedom in space. And um, the polity, we've moved far enough ahead in technology to be able to have AIs that run everything. So basically there are these super intelligent AIs that tell the tell the agents what to do. You know, we it's so it, it's but the each of the AIs have personalities and so um every once in a while the characters in the book talk about different like the AIs that that manage or govern a ship, a battleship, how that might have a cranky 
personality or an AI that manages a certain spot, what's called a runcible, where people are able to move through time and space and um, and come out relatively unscathed. On the other end, those the AIs that run the runcibles, each runcible has its own personality. So basically it's like these AIs are human born and have personalities to to reflect that hmm. kind of it's an it's interesting it's an interesting read i'm sure someone like if gord is still in the chat room i don't know gord would have read some of these someday the ais they'll rule us all so my my birthday's coming up <gasps> do you think i should get this shirt Here, can you see it? Is that a unicorn eating a cake? Wait, I see. Let me just stop talking so I can see it. Yes, it says, "Giddy up! It's my birthday." <laughs> it's pretty nice. I kind of like the Godzilla birthday one better, though. Yeah, they have one that's there's a robot one, and they have another They're robot one that, Zilla. They have another one that's Highly a cat. During the city. Here, here's the cat. It's my birthday. Lavish me with attention, then leave me alone. It's a good one. Kind of funny. Kind of funny. Yeah, who's been coerced? Who has been coerced by the NSA? This is the thing, too. It's Yeah, if, if this was in the hands of... Who has people, been coerced, yeah. If this was in the hands of some foreign government, everybody would have been... Co uh, coerced. If this was in North Korea's hands, if this was in China's hands, if this was in Syria's hands, yes. But this is America. Americans don't stand for that BS. You know? And it's, the information that they're collecting isn't necessarily it's connections between communications. Supposedly trying to make sure it's got to be an overseas element. You know? It's supposed to be. Um, but, you know, and part of it, part of a lot of the this, uh, what was going on was running through 2008 and ended for the, from what I've seen thus far, specific individuals who were Americans who were targeted. They were targeted as part of this whole search for the sleeper cell. Yes, public Muslim individuals, even working for the Bush administration, were targeted by the NSA under the Bush administration to see if they had ties to terrorist groups. Or supposedly because some of their communications were, you know, it's like the six degrees of Kevin Bacon. It was like the six degrees of Osama, right? Like, how right. can you make connections between leaders and these people? And, and yeah, if you look at enough metadata, you maybe can make connections between people who it wasn't otherwise obvious. But, uh... Yeah, I would definitely not want to see it dismantled or hindered too much because I am confident still that a strong NSA makes for a safe United States. And 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 this also the big bit of trepidation in all this is <laughs> one aspect of looks is like, well, yeah, I'm not a criminal. I'm not like a secret criminal. I actually have nothing to hide. You there's nothing you could dig up on me that would give you leverage on anything in my life. Uh, yep. But that's not necessarily the thing to be afraid of. The thing to be afraid of is 5, 10, 20 years from now, radical political shift in a country, and suddenly your affiliation with an organization that believed in science of all things becomes uh. something in your past that you will be rooted out for. Like, you never know, like, what the future or a different regime or political climate change. I mean, the FBI was investigating, gone undercover with the Quakers of all of the salt-of-the-earth type people, you know, <laughs> to go... I mean, these people who went and did public work for public work, not for conversion uh, uh, points, right? They weren't out there feeding people or building bridges to convert people to Quakerism, they were doing it to help people. 
you know, this is the, the family where you go and you sit and it doesn't come out of your domination. We're going to keep it pretty, you know, chill for you. You're welcome here. The family, it's got a lot of names, right? The, the friends. Uh, these people were investigated by the FBI. These devout the pacifists. Yeah. They put sleeper cell FBI agents in, in with them to monitor them after 9-11. Some ridiculous type investigations go on. Uh, when you know nothing. I have a feeling, hopefully, <laughs> an, an organization with a little bit more big brotherhoodness uh, might be able to go, yeah, actually, the Quakers, we don't really need to. We could probably leave them out of the picture. Yeah, they're not. Yeah, we're already in trouble because we have verbally, many times over, professed our appreciation of the sciences. Right? Yeah. And And you never know... In in Evangelerica of 2050, that may be that may be a crime punishable by having to sit through hour upon hour of Benny Hinn. <laughs> you don't know what the future is going to bring. So so the privacy thing, not necessarily just about what's happening now. Um. Yeah. Oh, yeah. California atheist science uh, 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 science enthusiast, punishable by death in 2050 Evangelica, which is what the country will be known. Not to be confused by the billboard bombshell of the Los Angeles uh, early 90s. If any, but nobody, you have to be old and from LA to get that one. I'll be right back. I'll be right back. Where are you going? I'll be right back. Ugh. He's like, I'm done talking for a minute. I'll be right back. <sighs> yeah, what's going on? The NCSE, National Center for Science Education, is with a group of, with a bunch of other groups, or I just got a, a press notification that they are um, going to be promoting a student's bill of rights so that no matter what, religiously, people would like to see curriculums look like, that students would get there's a certain certain amount of information that we that we perceive to be indelible but should be shared with all students support us on I'm adding links to everything right now I'm trying to do work while I have fun. we go. Sweet. Yeah, it's a really good series, Gord. I'm really enjoying it. I've read Gridlinked. I'm now in the second book called The Line of the Polity, and I'm really enjoying it. And there's so many books. This Neil Asher, he's got so many books. It's so great when you see find somebody who has tons of books written. You're just like, oh, this is going to take me a while. That's fun. Awesome. Information is power. <laughs> no, CR1. We must continue the nonsense. Continue the nonsense for everyone. Rourke's, you love the after shows. This one has been a Justin-powered after show, which is good. It's all good. <laughs> Look, I see there are 25 people from Google Plus watching us on the event page or watching us right now. Who is there watching? I'm watching. George Kofi Osei, Sujata Singh, Caitlin Duarte, Supi Kupi Ruiz, Kupi Kupi, Jazaya Kalfa, Michael Daumer, Mohamed Mubaraki, uh, 
I cannot read that. Nevena Matish, Masayana, Jesse Davis. So many names that I'm sure I'm not pronouncing at all. Out Zero Z, Prakash Shand. Again, something I can't pronounce. Jacqueline Zhang. I don't even know what that is. Chen Chen, Romeo Belli, Abdullah Coben, Braima Mbalo, Hossein Arzamanzadebik. Am I even close? Ezio Troito. Who are these people watching? They're watching. Hello, Google Plusers, if you're watching. Watchers. The Watchers. Hello. <clears throat> so, what else is news? What else is news? Oh, yeah. Supreme Court. Exactly, KFR. The Supreme Court is dismantling all progress made during the 70s. Mm -hmm. Slowly. Just trying to backpedal there a little bit, saying, oh, yeah, by the way, ladies, ladies, that whole making your own choices kind of thing. No. No. We think we know what you should do with your bodies. Now, listen to us. We are very intelligent old men. We know what you should do for, with your body. That's right, ladies. Yeah. Yeah, that's a bunch of bull honky. I would like every if I worked for Hobby Lobby, the Hobby Hobby Lobby. CR wait, CR1. I wish they would just finish the job and declare money equals votes. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. So, okay, so I agree with the Supreme Court ruling. Oh, dear. Here's, here's, here's what's weird. You do. I, I didn't at first. Oh. I didn't at first, right? Um, but I now do. And I mm. now say, fine. Fine. Yeah. That's the as ruling. Long as, as long as the government backs it up and makes sure that they're exactly is, so is, this so this that the health care is funded, right? right? This the now federal triggers, government has to take care of it. Exactly. That now triggers that as an absolute necessity. Yeah. That now is be is required to be a function of government. So so you the know the problem the problem though is that there are now going to be this isn't just a health care issue, now it is a uh, corporate personhood, religious rights issue, and corporations who potentially could be applying for federal contracts have um, mm -hmm. have put for have have sued to get the portion that would make them um, have fair hiring practices have that have that removed so that they wouldn't have to worry about whether or not they hired somebody who was gay or they discriminated against somebody who was of some denomination or sexual preference or sex that they didn't approve of. I mean, they're working to try and say, I don't like hiring people who are gay, so I shouldn't have to. That's basically what they're saying to the federal government. Just because the federal government thinks that everybody should be equal, I don't think so. That's what they're doing, and they're doing it as a basis on uh, based on the Hobby Lobby result because of the corporate personhood um, issue. So this has fallout, fallout consequences that are even broader than the healthcare. Which, sure, I get what you're saying. That yeah, great. This it'll strengthen the federal mandate. It'll strengthen the federal health healthcare coverage. All women will be covered, no matter what. You know, I get that. I get that. But the other consequences that potentially it will lead to are damaging. Yeah. No, agreed. Agreed. And then, but the, there's also an element of better know your corporate citizen, right? So, 
And, and I, mean, I, I don't want to make my own prejudiced <laughs> over over overreaching statement here. Uh -huh. I'm going to try to avoid doing so and still making my point. But I have a feeling that if the Hobby Lobby were to take a significant anti-gay stance, there's a potential they could feel that economically. Just, I don't know this for a fact. This is an oversweeping, this is a generalization. Um, but, you know, better know your corporate citizen. All right, now I know my XYZ corporation doesn't like women, gays. My, my XYZ corporation doesn't want uh, to support anything that I support. You know what? Better that I know that. Sure, you can that I know that. not to shop certain places, which um, I've seen things, um, the, the, the foods company, the Eden Foods Company, which is also, um, I think, not, I, I, don't remember, I don't remember the details of the Eden Foods, but it's a similar kind of thing where they don't want to um, either hire certain people or offer health care. I think it's the health care uh, thing. They don't want to give women certain, con they don't want to give women any contraception contraceptive um, coverage in their health care at all. And so there have been, you know, um, graphics that people have mocked up saying, buy this instead of this. Yeah. Buy this product instead of the Eden Foods product, saying right. you have other options. If you want to keep buying their particular type of thing, There's there are other companies that do it. And so I think that's important, but it's getting that information out there so that people people know and I think it's just real there's well, so much well I, I mean I can, I can remember back to uh, Domino's pizza making a very anti-choice you know sort of public commentary and support and and I think it, it impacted their business because people said hey you know what this is this is something ideologically that this corporation is for that I'm against or against that I'm for, and I'm not going to supply them with dollars. Yeah, and 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 it's a dangerous it's, thing it's, for for any corporation mm -hmm. to to engage in. I think when you're talking more about okay, Catholic uh, funded operated hospitals not wanting to pay for child uh, child support, uh, not wanting to pay for um, birth control. You know, there is, there's a couple things that go on there. Okay, that means it can't be allowed federal funding for operations now because they're in violation of federal federal mandates. But also there is something that if it's a religious organization, do you allow Sharia law to be enacted for all employees working for XYZ company? Do you allow everyone to have to live under a, a strict Catholic mandate if they work through some auspice of a Catholic funded organization, you know, it, it raises a lot of really tough questions. But if we as a country will agree that, you know, birth control is something that should be covered under, I think, again, a federal mandate on that can trump and, and can be strengthened by the necessity for it becomes that much stronger for more of that one payer, you know, government healthcare system. Yeah. And there is, you know, and there's companies are so inconsistent. You know, having healthcare in one part of the country versus another part of the country based on who the private suppliers of those insurances are varies wildly and dramatically as it is. You know, that was one of the big hoo ha's about Obamacare is how many people were going to get kicked off of their insurance. Well, the reason people were getting kicked off of their insurance is their insurance policies that had been signed up for didn't cover very much. They didn't meet the federal mandates for what health insurance should cover, meaning people were paying the same rate in Arkansas as they were paying in California, but they were getting half the coverage. You know, so there's, uh, there's a lot of... There's a lot of fighting and fretting that need to be done on this. Yeah, um, yeah. There's a lot. Of, there's a lot of fighting, fighting and fretting that has to be done on this for sure. 
for sure. I just feel like it opened it, the whole door that the corporate personhood thing opens up and allowing corporations to have choices mm-hmm. when really the corporate personhood thing is it's a it's a legalese issue solely mm-hmm. so that corporations can write contracts and have and sign them as a business like there is a there is a business reason to consider them a quote unquote person in legalese right. in legal terms but not taking it this far and actually like really giving them oh. the benefits of oh, a no person. no no we we need to take it further <laughs> take it further no and then the other like... thing and then i was going to say the other thing though about the corporations i mean there are like four corporations in the world that run everything. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know? okay. so, so part of part of what I would I would uh, say, in, first of all, one of the things in in the car business is that you can contract with a company. You have a controlling financial officer or CEO come in; they can sign paperwork, mm-hmm. and the company has now contracted uh, to purchase a vehicle, and they can be held liable in a court of law if they don't pay for the vehicle. Boom. Uh, Trickier, trickier with a church, a church organization technically actually can just default and not pay you. So it's very hard to get a loan for a church to do something because under some sort of bizarre thing, being not being a corporation, they're an organization that is almost leaderless. And almost doesn't mm-hmm. have a chief financial officer, somebody who can just have signed for something, unless they've incorporated some portion of their their business. So it can be tricky there. But uh, as the corporate personhood, you know, I just wish that if you're going to claim it for the right to donate money, the right to this, the right to that, the right to do all these different things as a corporate personage, when your corporation commits a crime, it needs to do time. Yes. If you've committed any sort of fraud as a company and you've been out for it, okay, the, guess yeah, what? Your benefits. company is now in jail for the next two years. Does that mean you, you round up all the employees and throw them into the, the, the hooskow? No, you don't. But what does jail mean? It means you don't interact with society and you don't have, uh, uh, you, you don't worry. You're, you're put on hiatus for a while. So that's what you do. The company commits a crime. Under corporate personage, that company is no longer in business for the duration of the sentence. You know, hey, yeah. of course, nobody would go for that. Well, it's not the corporation; it's some aspect. Somebody made a bad call. Somebody made this decision over here. Oh, that really? Did, really? That's yeah. convenient. Makes you immune from commun- uh, criminal behavior. The way they that that yeah. works is you get a fine. The company has to pay a fee of some sort. And as we've seen, actually going back to the auto industry. Sometimes when it comes to safety, the evaluation has been it will be cheaper to pay for the victims of this should-be recall than it is to actually enact the fix on all the many hundreds of thousands of vehicles that are out there. The uh, the other part of this, going to the science aspect of it, is that the Supreme Court uh, justices allowed this decision based on faulty science and faulty salesmanship of um, how these contraceptives work. The four contraceptives that Hobby Lobby was allowed to omit from their health care plans um, don't actually cause abortions. The four health, the four types of contraception, uh, two of them are IUDs and two of them are what are called uh, colloquially, colloquially, the morning after pill, um, and none of them actually cause an abortion, which would be killing, quote unquote, destroying a um, a fertilized egg. None of them do that. What they do, I actually have one of the four kinds of birth control, and it's a little bit of copper, and the copper is released into the area sperm don't like copper it messes them up copper messes up sperm so yeah copper 
who knew? Copper messes up sperm, and it also potentially um, it just make it makes fertilization not happen. Fertilization doesn't happen. That's that's the way it works. And then the same thing is for the hormone IUD, and also for the morning after pills. They are pumped up birth control pills that make it so that the sperm get mucked up and the environment is not great and nothing happens. No abortion. And they kept saying, they kept saying, oh, it's against our religion because it kills the baby and blah, blah, blah. These things do not do anything like that. We know that that does not happen. The science was faulty, people. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I know, Twit Refugee. Scalia, no, it's science no, when you've got based, on, it's based on hypocrisy. It's not based on science. You're right. Bunch of wasted breath. Mm. Anyway. Well, if on, only, the, uh, if on only the upside. Everybody listen to the science. If only. Uh, yeah. <laughs> they didn't know that our skin smelled things. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that was that's such a bizarre concept that, that your that your skin is smelling stuff and reacting to it. You know, it's it's actually it's it's the the idea that your skin is 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 a sensor that's reacting to stuff without you having to think or even know about it is just that's a little frightening. Yeah, a little frightening. My brain is in charge. Is not in charge. It's just my skin. My skin made this decision for me. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So whiskey renegade. I the whole idea about just lowering the cost and making people responsible for their own decisions. If healthcare were affordable, it would be something that could be part of the conversation. I don't see the costs going down, so we have to figure other ways around it. The only way that anything's going to change at all, though, is a complete reset of the entire system, and the likelihood of that happening is, no, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, the whole system needs to be reset before anything in all this changes, and then we're back to, you know, fighting for, for people to listen to you even more, maybe, I don't know, I don't know, Justin, did you go away again? I need to go to bed. Yeah, none of the female justices, none of the female justices even... There are conservative females up there, and they didn't vote that way. Come on, people. Yeah, if nobody could pay for health insurance, for health care... <laughs> No, Whiskey Renegade, uh, CR1, if nobody offered insurance, uh, it would take a while to lower costs. There would be a lot of dead people. That would be what would happen first, and that's not something people are going to allow. Yeah. I need to go to bed. I'm starting to get tired. I got the tired. It's 11 uh, o'clock. Okay. I've been ranting for ages. Uh -huh. 11 o'clock, kids, here in California. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, federal government would be great at running health care. Just look at the VA. Exactly. Ha, ha, ha. Sad trombone sound inserted here. Oh, there's no easy answers to stuff. <laughs> ah. No. I want easy answers. I know, right? Wouldn't easy answers be wonderful? Oh, well. That's why we like science, the complexity of the universe. So so next week's after show, i got to figure out how to do this because I don't know how. But I want to play the the... I need to do a Google Hangout for people at some point. I want to play the uh, Jack Feedback Betty Bot Ooh, episode cool. to date, that which has been uh, put together thus far next week. How do we cool. do Cool. Uh, well, it depends how big it is. You could send it to me. 
I think I could convert it to an MP3. Yeah. And possibly... You could do like a private a private SoundCloud or something and give me the oh, link. Oh, it's only SoundCloud. And then I could play Can you it? play? Can you play? How do you play? I don't have a way to play. How come I can't play stuff? Let me... You, what do I need to be able to play stuff? I have a mixer and another computer. I've got the other computer over I there. I don't have decided. A... That's how I've decided to solve it. I have a mixer that plugs into my sound card. Kiki, send me a mixer. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I need a mixer. I want to be able to play sounds over here. All right. Yeah, a Behringer. There's a specific model of Behringer. It's on my wish list somewhere. I'll figure it out. Okay, Behringer's easy to do. Yeah, let me know. Yeah, I don't. I don't need like a big fancy hundred channel mixer thing. I just need. I want to be able to get. I want to be able to get the audio on the line to the people. I wonder if I can update Chrome. I don't think I can. Yeah, I don't think I can play SoundCloud on this computer. It's a really old laptop <laughs> with a really old browser. But I have other. I have other. Laptop. Oh, uh, Ben Rothig, Jack and Coke or Mojito? Uh, it's Jack and Coke all the way. I'm Jack a big fan of Spearmint. Jack I've got I got the Spearmint plants. Please. I got Spearmint and Peppermint plants growing out in front of my place. I'm such Please. a mint lover, but not in my cocktails. Thank you very much. Uh, and actually, uh, honestly, Jack and Coke, more likely Canadian Mist and Pepsi. <laughs> it's more, it's more I don't know what what Jack and Ginger? Joke. I like Jack and Ginger. I don't know what it is. Oh, that's good too. I don't know what it is about. And, and Jack and Pepsi work just as well, actually. But I don't know what it is about the Coke portion of it. But I, I, I am a member of the Pepsi generation, so I like to mix my whiskey with Pepsi. That's an unsolicited major corporation promo right there. We're probably going to have to pay them. Darn it. Ben, Rosie, you've been sick all night. I'm sorry. I'm glad that you were able to stay up. Feel better. Feel Just, better soon. Yeah. That's that's the thing that changed my order. Yeah. Jack and... You know what? Actually, just Jack. That, just Jack. That that's sounds like right. me. That does. All right. I'm going to go... Try and lie in bed and read a little bit of my book before I go and pass out. That's what I want to do. Okay. I am going to uh, wrap myself in this flag I found on the moon as wrap night draws near on the moon. moon. Which, yes, I, I know it's never night on this. I'd have to travel to the other You'd side of the travel. moon. And then it would be really cold, and that, that would not really be warm enough. Nighty night, everybody. It is. It does become night on the moon, people. It is night on the moon very often. Um, just because the same side of the moon faces us doesn't mean the moon's always the dark side of the moon is just the moon that faces away from us. It's not that that side of the moon is dark. The far side. The side of the moon isn't dark. It's the far side. There is nighttime on the moon, as you can see. Our side. As you can see, it's nighttime on a good portion of planet Earth right now. Um, Thank you for explicating. I'm assuming is a hemisphere, or that might be east. I don't know. I can't tell from the moon what part of the Earth that is. But if I was over here, I'd be watching out for hurricanes, and I think that might be the Bermuda Triangle. Yeah, watch out for the polar vortex. The polar vortex oh, is going to get you moon. this week. Or Australia. Or Antarctica. I, from the moon, it's really hard to tell. It's yeah, hard to really tell from the moon. Really swirly, whirly, wibbledy-wobbledy planet when, when seen from here. So pretty. So pretty. I love it. I love your backdrop. Yeah, uh, Twitter Refugee did <laughs> point out, Jack's flag. It's a fake. A real flag on the moon would be bleached white by now. <laughs> yeah, okay. You caught me. Uh, I brought this one with me. I didn't realize there was already one here. I was like, I want to be the first to put the flag on the moon. 
But now it turns out, uh, I thought the moon had surrendered, but it turns out that was an American flag uh, at one point. Good night, everyone. Thank you so much for watching. Really hey, appreciate hey, it. Thanks room, for chat, chatting. No fighting. No fighting, yeah, no fighting. in the chat room. No fighting in the chat room. Get along. Everybody hug. Make up. Inhale. All right. Get along. Inhale again. Get along some more. Like I tell Kai, Before take a deep breath. Count to four. Time. By trapped, I mean willfully going on this very long Tiger. Good night, everybody. everybody. Good night. Thank you so much. Have a good week.